for some background on the Virginia Water Monitoring Council. The Virginia Water Monitoring Council encourages collaboration among water monitoring programs in Virginia. The council promotes communication through our weekly emails and water-related events, publications, and job opportunities from across Virginia and beyond. We currently have more than 700 participants who represent more than 275 organizations uh, uh, across the state. Our membership represents diverse interests from local governments, state and federal environmental agencies, academia, consultants, citizen scientists, and in industry. Anyone with an interest in the water marching is invited to join, and membership is free, and you really cannot beat free these days. If you're not a member, you're welcome to join at any time. Simply send your name, water monitoring affiliation if you have one, and contact information to vwmc at vt.edu. We hope you'll enjoy uh, join the Virginia Water Monitoring Council and if you're uh, not if you're already not a member. For today's conference, I'm pleased to now to recognize our 2021 scholarship recipients. Each year we honor the memory of Ken Brooks, who provided conference scholarships in his name. Ken was a longtime member of the Council Steering Committee, a volunteer water monitor, and a strong proponent of getting young people involved in water monitoring. This year we awarded Ken Brooks scholarships that covered the conference registration fee to two undergraduates. McKenna Dunbar, who is double majoring in environmental studies and business administration at the University of Richmond, and Max Morin, who is a double majoring in environmental sciences and environmental thought and practice at the University of Virginia. Welcome McKenna and Max. We are also grateful this year for the Virginia Water Research Resources Research Center for providing scholarships to cover today's registration fee for five students. These recipients include Abigail Belvin, who is a PhD candidate in entomology at Virginia Tech. Liz Bikimia, who is working for on her master's in environmental studies at the Virginia Commonwealth University. Joshua Moser, who is a doctoral student in fisheries and wildlife sciences at Virginia Tech. Zachary Perkins, who is a master's student in environmental sciences at the University of Virginia. And Julia Portman, a master's student in biology at James Madison University. Congratulations to all of our scholarship participants, our recipients. We are grateful to have you with us today. I want to begin today to thank everyone for attending. Your participation in this year's annual conference helps to make this a success. At last count, we had more than 120 people registered for the conference. And looking at our attendance here, we are quickly filling that up. And 54 are online at the moment. I also want to thank our partners who made this a conference a possibility. Uh, we appreciate the presenters for giving their time today to uh, present at the conference and share their experiences and their interests with all of us. We also appreciated Henrico County in hosting this WebEx session. A very special thank you goes out to Henrico County's Kenny Mitchell, Morgan, Morgan Edwards, and Matthew Batroff, who is providing audiovisual support. Also, we want to acknowledge Matthew's advice service as a member of the Council Steering Committee as our Henrico uh, partner. We are grateful to the Alliance Chesapeake Bay for handling the conference registration. A special thank you goes to the Alliance's Stofi Stern and Liz Judova. Like Matthew, Liz serves on the Council Steering Committee as the Vice Chair, and uh, Liz is also a presenter today as well. We appreciate the support from the Water Resources Research Center at Virginia Tech. As I already mentioned, the Water, Research, Water Center provided funding for five scholarships for college students uh, to attend the event today. It also promoted the conference and provides administrative assistance to the Virginia Water Monitoring Council throughout the year. The Water Center's director, Stephen Schoenholtz serves as the council steering uh, serves on the council steering committee. We appreciate the organization that are supporting today's conferences conference, including 
the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality with funding from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the Virginia Lakes and Watersheds Association, and the Lake Anna Civic Association. And last but not least, I want to thank all the members of the Water Monitoring Council Steering Committee. The committee provides leadership to the council and helps plan the annual conference and other educational programs. We appreciate everyone's support and are glad to have you with us today. Before we begin the presentations, I do have a few housekeeping announcements. Each registrant has, sent, has been sent a copy of the conference agenda and we'll try to follow the, the times on the agenda as best as possible, but some flexibility may be required. We have planned a 15 more, minute morning break, an hour and a half for lunch, and a 15 minute afternoon break. If you have a question or comment for the speaker during the presentation, simply use the chat feature, which is located on the lower right hand corner of your screen. You may type in your question and comment in the provided text box and hit enter to submit it. During the question answer period, Liz Chidova will read as many questions as possible and allow the presenter to respond. There will be a couple of short videos shown during the presentation. The videos can be viewed by clicking on the layout and then full screen in the upper right hand corner of your WebEx screen to provide the best resolution possible. If you experience any technical issues such as not being able to see the screen or cannot hear the speaker, simply type a description of the issue in the chat feature. Kenny Mitchell will do his best to help you fix the issue. Also know that today's conference is being recorded. All registrants will be sent a link of the recording after the conference. If you've requested a certificate of attendance, it will be sent to you by email the fo uh, following the conference. Also after the conference, you will receive a link to an online evaluation survey it, we would ask uh, you the topics of the most interest for you for future events and ask if you know of good speakers for our 2022 conference, which hopefully we will have in person. We ask that you complete the survey and it should only take a few minutes. Your responses to evaluation has greatly helped us in the past to plan our uh, conferences to provide timely and effective presentations. That's all I have for housekeeping um, and for our opening remarks. And so we will begin our presentation here in just a moment. I actually went through my announcements a little bit quicker than, than we had planned. Well, we can get an early start to the conference. Um, so for Today's uh, keynote speech, um, I'm pleased to announce um, Brian Richter. Brian is the president of Sustainable Waters. Uh, this global organization focuses on the challenges of water scarcity. Brian promotes sustainable water use and management with governments, corporations, universities, and local communities. He serves as the water advisor to corporations, investment banks, and the United Nations. Brian also teaches water sustainability at the University of Virginia. He previously served as the director of global water program for the Nature Conservancy and has consulted on more than 170 water programs nation, projects nationwide. Brian has received uh, developed scientific tools and methods to support water protection and restoration efforts. And he has co-authored a book with Sandra Postel entitled Rivers of Life, Managing Water for People and Nature and his latest book is Chasing Water, a guide for moving from scarcity to sustainability. It has been published in five languages. Brian, welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, and, uh, and good morning to all of you out there. I uh, certainly wish, of course, that we could have mixed it up and, uh, and been able to spend some time together in person, but um, we're making the best out of this virtual situation. Um, Ironically, it enabled me to extend my vacation out in the Western United States uh, by a couple of weeks. Um, so I'm actually joining you from Moab, Utah, and it's a little bit earlier out here than it is uh, for you. Um, the topic that I'd like to talk about today um, has to do with water use and the changing water use in the United States. And I think it's a really, really interesting story, actually. 
Um, and I hope that you'll all find, uh, find something of interest in this presentation. So as I go through the presentation, if we could just advance, I'm just going to say click. Um, and so let's, let's go with the first click here. So I want to start by acknowledging my colleagues. So this is a project that is what I'm going to report on are some, some finalized results and some preliminary results um, from what has now become a three plus year project. And uh, these are some of my some of my key collaborators on this project uh, that have been working with us very closely. And I also want to acknowledge um, I pressed uh, a number of my UVA students um, into helping with this research project uh, over the last couple of semesters. So certainly want to give them some recognition too. Click, please. Okay, so here's the big picture that got us started. Um, we, we became very fascinated with these changing trends in overall water use within the United States. And so on this slide, as you can see, the, um, we've had very strong and steady population growth um, since the middle of the last century. And along with that population growth, the total water use in the United States um, increased, in, increased proportionally until about 1980. And then we started to see a very, very interesting shift um, or what we'll call in this presentation a decoupling of the rates of population growth with the increases in water use. And so if you can click on the next bullet here, um, what we've been able to see over the, over the time period um, since 1980 is that the population grew by 41%. Um, the national economy, uh, very strong growth, um, six-fold growth over that time period. And yet total water use in the United States dropped by um, a whopping 26%. So we think that's a fascinating story. And for us, we had, we had the sense that a lot of this was probably explained by the changes in urban water use. Um, certainly there's other large water uses with thermoelectric power generation and with irrigated agriculture. Um, but we really wanted to drill in a little bit deeper and see whether or not we couldn't better understand what's been going on in cities across the United States and how much of the changes in their water use um, accounts for some of these some of these national trends that we're seeing. Click. So the first phase of our study, um, actually the first phase was uh, we started to collect data from cities, municipalities all across the United States. And by the way, this, um, this research was quite difficult, I want to I say, because there is no national mandate for municipalities, localities to report on their, on their public water supply, um, on the usage, on their service populations, and that sort of thing. So this project literally involved contacting staff in each of the individual water utilities and asking or begging uh, for them to share some of their data. And so um, very, very difficult. Sometimes we had to request many, many times before we could get the information. Sometimes we had to file a Freedom of Information Act request in order to access some of this information. So we started out nationally, but one of the things that we immediately begin to understand is that that because the story that we were wanting to look at had to do with this decoupling idea. In other words, we wanted to look at counties and municipalities in which two things were happening. The population was increasing, and at the same time, the water use was, was either staying stable or coming back down. And so we, we filtered um, with, with those two criteria in mind. And so that led us to a stronger emphasis or a stronger focus, I should say, on the Western United States. And you can see the stat there at the top of the slide. So um, among those counties that met those two criteria, increasing growth and stable or decreasing water use, uh, we found that two thirds of all the Western counties that had growing populations have been able to reduce their urban water use. So right out of the chutes, looking at the county, um, kind of the, the coarser scale level, um, we saw these very, very interesting um, indications that something interesting is going on. Click. So here's our first punchline. Um, and this was, this was uh, these results were published uh, in a paper at the end of 2020. I'll give you that citation at the end of the presentation here. 
but very, very interesting that on average across all of these populations that we sampled, um, again, this was going directly to the water utilities themselves. We found that on average their populations were, were growing by a little bit more than 20%. And yet at the same time, their water use not only didn't grow, but it dropped um, by 19%. And when we started to unpack that a little bit, we further um, gained the understanding that about two thirds of those reductions are attributable to lowered residential use. So it's what we're doing in our homes, what's changed with water use in our homes that's really made the difference in this story. Click. So, as I said, we published the results from our Western US um, analysis of, of the water utilities there. Uh, but then our attention started to be drawn to the Colorado River Basin. And I think many of you um, in the audience today understand why that is. Um, it's, it's hard to go through a week now without seeing major news headlines about the water crisis that has been emerging in the Colorado River system. In a nutshell, what's been happening in the Colorado River system is that the total use of the water, the, the total consumption of the water has increased over time to the point where it now is repeatedly, the use of water is now repeatedly higher than the flow of water coming down through the Colorado River system. Um, as I say, that's been coming about for some time. The, the use has been increasing um, pretty steadily over time. And now all of a sudden we are repeatedly using more water in many years than is coming down through the river system. Now, well, the only way that you can do that, the only way demand can get above the supply is when you have really large water storage reservoirs. And so that's been the case for both Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Um, as of today, they are both about 70% depleted, um, so 70% empty. And unfortunately, that trend continues. Uh, we saw um, substantial reductions in the water volume in both of those large reservoirs in this year. Um, and it looks like next year is setting up to be an, another pretty bad year. By the way, these two reservoirs are the two largest water storage reservoirs in the United States. So this is, this is a really, really serious crisis. Um, I can't even hardly begin to tell you the, the impacts that this is already having. Um, on Lake Powell, for example, all of the boat marinas, 13 boat marinas closed this summer because of the water levels getting down to be too low. Uh, these two reservoirs generate a lot of hydropower electricity. And that hydropower generation is now down by almost 30%. And the reservoirs are getting to the point where they're approaching the point at which they won't be able to, um, the, the hydropower intakes will no longer be receiving water because the lake will have dropped down below those intakes, which means you turn, you're flipping the switch. You're turning off some of the largest electricity generators in the southwestern United States. Uh, so. The potential impact, the, the actual impacts and the potential impacts are mounting very rapidly and there's a great deal of concern. Both the federal and the state governments are working on this 24 seven, trying to address this issue. So that's the setup for saying that our research now has shifted toward the water utilities that are dependent in part or in whole on the Colorado River's water. We wanted to understand what's going on with the, with the urban water uses in this river basin so that we could better understand the potential for bringing this river basin, the water use in this river basin back into a sustainable balance. And so we wanted to see the urban part of that story. Okay, click. So this is how the utilities that we've sampled um, are distributed. You can see from the, from the note at the bottom there, we have been successful in acquiring data uh, from more than 40 of the water utilities that use the Colorado River system in some way, to some degree. And one of the interesting things about this map, which uh, may be a little bit confusing to some of you at first blush, is that not all of the urban water use of the Colorado River um, exists within the geographical boundaries of the Colorado River system, of the Colorado River's watershed. So, for instance, um, over there on the left, you see there's a lot of utilities in Southern California. 
that are dependent upon the Colorado River. They bring it over by pipe and canal and pump um, to get it over the coastal mountain range out to, uh, the, to the West Coast. Um, up in the upper right, uh, what we call the front range cities of Colorado, Denver, Aurora, Colorado Springs, Boulder, Fort Collins, all of those cities are quite dependent upon diverting water out of the upper reaches of the Colorado River system and piping water through the Rocky Mountains to deliver to the Front Range cities. And then lastly, in the bottom right um, over there, you see um, that's that dot is Albuquerque, New Mexico. So there's there's another diversion um, out of one of the major tributaries of the Colorado River called the San Juan River, and they divert water out of the San Juan um, over into the, the Rio Grande Basin where Albuquerque utilizes that water. Okay, so uh, so our, our sampling, our data acquisition involved, as I say, more than 40 utilities and their service populations total up to over 27 million residents. Now, we were quite pleased with that result because um, the estimate presently is that, that about 40 million people are dependent upon the Colorado River's water. So we're getting a we're getting a good chunk of it um, in our in our work in our research. Uh, click. Okay, so um, I'm going to share with you some some early results from this work. We're working very very hard to to get this into a a peer reviewed paper and get it published in a journal. Um, but I'm going to be giving you a sneak preview here in a second on some of those results. But the key metrics that we were looking at in this, re in this research was um, not on here, but of course, how's the population, the service population of the utility changing over time? That's really, really key. Um, but then from the water standpoint, we wanted to know how many gallons are being used per person per day on average, what we call residential GPCD. Um, that's the term there. This is and residential, of course, is again, this is in home use. Um, it could be multi density housing. It could be apartments. It could be single family residences, but that's all lumped under this residential uses. Then another metric we were looking at was total gallons per capita per day. And um, in this metric or in this variable, uh, what we're doing is we're taking all of the water that's being used for all purposes whether it's in manufacturing or whether it's in um, uh, being used in public uh, landscape areas like golf courses or whether it's um, being used in commercial businesses. And so all of that gets lumped in the total water use and then you divide it by that same service population and you come up with this metric total gallons per capita per day, total GPCD. And then of course, we're also interested in um, how much water is being delivered overall? What's the total volume of water that's being delivered and how's that changing over time? Okay, click. Okay, so here is a sneak peek. My, my collaborators were quite nervous actually about um, the fact that uh, I'm sharing some of this early, these early results with you and the fact that it's being recorded. So please, um, uh, keep this in the house uh, for the time being. As I said, we'll we'll try and get this out into press uh, within the next couple of weeks. I'm I'm sorry, within the next couple of months. But here's this is pretty phenomenal story here, as you can see. So the the cities that are dependent upon the Colorado River um, are growing at a breakneck breakneck speed. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Phoenix, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, but we're also talking about those other cities, Denver, Colorado, Los Angeles, um, San Diego. And um, so cities big and small, um, but on average, they're growing. Uh, their growth is, is more than 31 percent. So that's that's pretty. Now, this is since 2000, by the way. This is an annual growth rate, of course. This is since the year 2000. And by the way, in our in our efforts to collect data from these utilities, we were asking for the longest period of record that they were willing to provide to us, but at a minimum, um, we were we were pretty insistent that we needed data since 2000, so that at least we would have two decades of information to work with. But then on the right two boxes, you see how we're doing with um, the the water use, the average water use per person, whether you're looking at total or or just residential. Very impressive, very very impressive that they could that they could drop 
um, their rate of average per person water use by that much. Now, what I don't have yet to show you is how the total volume of water use has changed. Um, there's um, there's some way some some things that we're trying to work out with the way that that is reported, um, but it is going to come out to be pretty impressive as well. Um, so they're not only holding the line and not increasing the total volume of use, but they're actually holding that stable or reducing. And I'm going to show you a couple slides for some of the cities that will illustrate the degree to which that is happening. So let's go ahead and click to the next slide. OK, so um, these slides are a little bit complicated. There's a lot of information um, embedded in this, and I apologize for that. So let me just explain. I'm going to show you three slides from three different cities. And um, let me just show you what and the color coding is the same in all of them. So the blue is the population growth um, over time. And again, each of these slides is set up from the year 2000 to the year 2020. The total volume of water deliveries is that orange line at the bottom. So you can see for Denver, it, it has actually decreased. Um, and uh, if the scaling was a little bit different, it's it's pretty impressive the degree to which Denver has been able to lower its overall water use. And the reason behind that is because the average use per person has dropped substantially, as you can see from the gray line, which is total uh, GPCD and the yellow line, which is the residential GPCD. So, again, pretty impressive results. Let's click and go to another another city, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so again, population growth there. Um, by the way, some of these cities really surprised us. We thought we had some data errors when we saw these drops in the pot in the service population. Well, that was the big crash, the big economic crash. And a lot of people lost their homes, moved out of these areas. And it's very pronounced in some places like Las Vegas, Nevada. But anyway, so population growth in Phoenix. You see down at the bottom, the orange line, decrease in total water use. And again, the trend lines there are the two GPCD lines in the middle. Um, so decreasing fairly, fairly steeply in a, to a very impressive degree. OK, next slide, click. In Los Angeles, we have not yet been able to acquire their residential water use data. Um, we've been persistently asking for that for a couple of years. I think we're going to get it. Um, in the next couple of weeks. But here again, the story um, increased in population there in the blue, um, decrease in the overall water use. Um, I do see that in, one, in the chat box, I'll go ahead and, and address this question. What percent of the total GPCD is residential? It tends to be about two thirds um, on average for most of these places. Now, that varies greatly, of course, from city to city. It all depends upon, and it tends to be the Residential portion tends to be smaller in the larger cities, and that's because in the larger cities, you have more manufacturing, uh, more industrial production, more thermal electric, hydro, uh, thermal electric um, energy production, and that sort of thing. And also, you know, more golf courses, more commercial landscape areas, and, that, and all of that too. But on average, it's about, just to give you some ballpark, it's about two thirds. So let's click, go to the next slide. OK, so of course, we're asking how in the world did this happen? So we um, fairly intensively surveyed each of these utilities and we examined all of their public documents. Um, so many of them have formal water conservation plans. Uh, many of them have long range water supply plans. We read everything that we could get our hands on. We looked at their websites. Um, we looked at any public presentations that they'd done and we and but most importantly, most of our learning about the why here came from individual interviews with the with the water utility staff. And so these were a couple of things that they that um, emerged as being the most important part of the explanation as to why they're able to lower their water use. Um, by far and away in municipal water use in the United States, one of the most single most important influences was the 1992 Energy Act. A lot of you might be scratching your head and saying, 
wait, where, what's, what's the connection here? What's, what's the explanation? Well, the 1992 Energy Act, um, the architects of that act at the federal level very well understood the connections between water and energy use. So that what we call the water energy nexus. And so they understood that it takes a lot of energy to pull water out of a river or out of a groundwater aquifer and deliver it to the end users. Um, it has to go through a cleaning process and the water treatment process is very energy intensive. After the water gets used, it has to get treated again in wastewater treatment plants, a lot of energy use there. So the framers of the 1992 Federal Energy Act said, we need to cut water use in order to lower energy use across the United States. Brilliant, brilliant move. And so it's had a huge effect because one of the one of the one of the requirements or mandates in that Federal Energy Act was that we had to replace all of our plumbing fixtures, specifically toilets. Um, at that time, there was an awful lot of toilets that were using six gallons per flush and they had to go to one and a half gallons. So a 75 percent reduction in toilet water consumption right off the top. But the federal act has also included some other plumbing fixtures, additional state um, acts have layered on additional requirements for washing machines and shower heads and dishwashers and that sort of thing. So anyway, all of that was really the policy move here was immensely important. And the calculation has been done that it lowered indoor water use across the United States um, by, by an average of 15%. Let's click and go to the next slide. But very, very important is also what's going on with use outside of the homes or outside of the businesses, the outdoor landscaping area. Um, in the Western US, that outdoor water use is very commonly 50, 60% of the total water use within the home or in the business. And surprisingly, there are many parts of the Eastern US um, where it's not far off of that, actually. In fact, the calculations have been done that across the United States, it's, it's average is about a half of water use um, within cities is going to outdoor landscaping. And so if you can figure out some way to lower that outdoor landscaping, you're taking away, you know, you're dealing with half of the water use in the cities. So there's been, there's been a lot of innovations. And I really want to give a shout out here to Las Vegas of all places. I think a lot of you might think, oh my gosh, Las Vegas has to be one of the most profligate, wasteful water users in the United States. I mean, you go there and you visit, they've got, they've got fountains, you know, spouting off, um, you know, all over the place, a lot of, you know, outdoor water features and that sort of thing. But they have been extremely successful and aggressive in their water conservation program. So for example, one of the things that they've done is they offered homeowners and business owners, um, they paid them on a square foot basis to rip out their green grass lawns and put in landscape vegetation that was far less water intensive, in many cases, utilizing native species, but certainly zero escape species as, as, or drought tolerant species as they're, they're referred to. And just that one move alone enabled Las Vegas to drop their residential water use by about 21% um, over a few years time. And it, it can, has continued to stay down there. By the way, they pay about $3 per square foot presently. So it's quite an incentive for the homeowners. And they've seen, they've had great success in seeing the homeowners ripping out those, those green grass lawns. Um, overall, Las Vegas' performance over the last decade has been very impressive. They've reduced their total water use by about a third. Click next slide. Now, because I'm, I'm making a point about this outdoor landscaping, um, and by the way, I forgot to say this at the top of the presentation, everything that I'm saying here is highly relevant to the Eastern US as well. I, I hope that was obvious to everybody listening in here. Um, and, and that reminds me of this because um, stormwater harvesting, uh, rainwater harvesting, uh, collecting the water that falls on your roof area or perhaps within um, impervious surfaces, you know, around your home or your business somehow and collecting that water and reusing it to, for, for in particular here, I'm talking about reusing it for your outdoor landscape watering. 
um, can be very, very significant. So I have personal experience with this. Uh, we installed a big cistern um, at our home in Crozet, Virginia, outside of, outside of Charlottesville. And we collect uh, rainwater off of a portion of our roofs and we utilize that rainwater to irrigate um, our vegetable gardens, our flower gardens, you know, and, and, and other, you know, plant species, you know, in our, in our yard. And it has enabled us to virtually completely eliminate having to use any of our potable water um, outdoors. And so I think this is equally applicable in the eastern U.S. as it is in the West. And the potential here is very large. If half the water is being used outdoors, we could really cut urban water use um, very substantially. So let's click and go to the next slide. So as we sampled across these 40 different water utilities um, utilizing the Colorado River, and we're looking at what are their strategies that they're using, this shows you what the most common strategies were. So um, there's a trend here again between big and small. So smaller towns and cities, they don't have the financial resources, they don't have the staff capacity to do really sophisticated water conservation measures, but virtually all of them, almost 90% of them are doing some kind of education and outreach about water use and trying to get their, their residents, their citizens to try to be more careful with their water use. But more than 80% of them have, have, a, have been able to, um, to do something about plumbing fixtures. And, and specifically in most cases, this is um, providing a financial rebate on the toilets so, so I mentioned the 1992 Energy Act mandated that all new toilets that were being sold were going to be far less water um, guzzlers. So dropping again from six gallons down to one and a half. Now, most of the toilets are down to 1.2 gallons per flush. But there's a problem for many cities, particularly older cities, that there's a lot of home stock um, where they still have those water guzzling toilets and other water guzzling washing machines and dishwashers. And so many cities, um, including many cities in Virginia, of course, are providing financial rebates for their citizens to, to take out those old fixtures and replace them with more water efficient fixtures to great excess, uh, great success. And so you see here more than 80% of the utilities that we surveyed are doing that. Landscape, um, again, financial rebates in many, many cases um, changing their pricing structure. So rather than a flat rate per unit of water, um, they are now doing tiered uh, rates, tiered structured rates, where the more water you use, the more you're having to pay per unit of water. And that's been a very effective tool for a lot of these cities and a lot of these utilities. Um, and you see some of the others there. Um, Rainwater storage, I'm going to come back to this. So, you know, about a third are trying to, to incentivize or encourage rainwater capture in some way. Um, but there's, there's much, much more potential there. And I'll highlight that here in just a moment. Okay, click on the next slide. Now, the one other thing that's been really important, um, and again, I think this has um, a considerable applicability in some of the eastern cities as well. When you're over utilizing a particular water source, in this case for these utilities, it's the Colorado River, um, it can be very important to help them find ways to use what's called alternative water sources, okay? If you're living in the West Coast of the United States, many of those cities, particularly the larger ones, are talking about desalination, taking ocean water and going through the desalination process or technology to produce some fresh water. It's a very expensive technology and it has some, it has some real challenges, but um, as you can see here, more than 10% more than of the utilities that we sampled are doing that. Stormwater capture, now this isn't just for use in outdoor areas. There are a number of cities, and I think Los Angeles really stands out here. Those of you that are interested in, in this kind of a strategy, Los Angeles is doing industrial scale stormwater capture. Um, by that, I mean large um, detention and retention ponds, uh, infiltration basins, getting that stormwater back into groundwater recharge and then subsequently pumping the groundwater and putting it into their potable drinking water supply. Um, so that's an alternative way and it helps to begin to help them wean themselves off of the Colorado River. 
Um, and similarly in recycled water, this is immensely important. And you can see more than, you know, about two thirds of the cities are actually implementing pretty aggressive recycled water programs now. Um, very few of them going into potable drinking water, but they're taking their process treated wastewater and they're then using that outdoor for their outdoor landscaping, trying to offset that half of the of the urban water use in that manner. Um, but some of them are going all the way and and really see their future as being very dependent upon being able to treat um, that water, the, re the, the wastewater to a um, potable drinking water um, standard. OK, so weaning yourself off is can be is becoming as important as water conservation of reducing your total use. OK, go ahead, please click. OK, so our punchline, of course, what does this all mean and why does it matter? Well, very importantly, um, it turns out that cities across the United States are proving that they can they can accommodate in the case of the Western US, pretty substantial increase in their service populations, and yet they can do that without increasing their total water use. Um, this is an incredible good news story. And again, I wanna remind you that it's not just about taking the pressure off of water supply or finding new water supplies and that sort of thing. It's about reducing our impact on existing water supply sources, reducing our use in Charlottesville on the Rivanna River, um, that sort of thing. It's very, very important. Um, but it's also about energy use. So what I, what I like to tell my students is to remind them that even though water conservation might not be the primary interest, that, you know, the city is not really experiencing water supply stress, um, they, can, they can reduce the energy use within the city by reducing their water use. And so because of that linkage again between water and energy. Okay, click. Uh, there is tremendous potential to do more um, across the United States. Um, I think there's, this is the good news. The bad news is that there's still a lot of cities and counties that are using, look at the stats there at the bottom, um, more than 300 gallons per person per day. Um, that's, that's high. In fact, I would, I would say, I would editorialize and say that's ridiculous. Um, and there's a lot of, but there's a lot of potential to do better. So ironically, in, in this map, you see counties, this is done at the county level. You see counties that are immediately adjacent to each other. And one county is using more than 300 gallons per capita per day. And the adjacent county is using under 100, less than a third. Of the, and it's actually more extreme when you get when you get down to smaller and smaller spatial resolution, you see a five five X differential between adjacent cities next door. So um, the underperformers need to get on board and we need to see, you know, we need to get you know, we need to certainly get under 100 gallons across the map. OK, click. Um, and here's some of the reasons that I'm very optimistic about our, our potential. So we have not run out of running room um, in this water conservation story. So again, going back to the plumbing fixtures, only half of American homes have efficient plumbing fixtures. So there's tremendous potential savings here to get all of those old fixtures out of the houses. Um, across the US, we could save 18% of indoor water use just by, by achieving that standard of getting all homes up, up to current standards. By comparison, Australian homes are 86% across the country, just to give you like an indication of, of comparison. Next click. Leak detention repair, always a problem, um, particularly in the older cities, you know, very, very old pipes and, and a lot of leaks going on. Uh, it's been estimated that about 14% of indoor use uh, could be resolved um, by, by getting better with leak detection. And many of the cities, cities that we surveyed are doing a pretty darn good job. Um, very, very sophisticated detection systems um, being put into place and and aggressively city of denver um you know counts their success in tens of miles um, of pipe repaired you know per year okay next click outdoor watering you know we've talked about that um, but just getting better not going to like complete removal of um of potable water use but Across the board, just by being more careful with outdoor watering, it's been estimated nationwide that we could save another 16%. Next click. 
And lastly, I wanted to hit on this, this stormwater capture. I'm pretty big on this, actually. I think there's a lot of potential from policy changes at the municipal level um, to somehow incentivize uh, the installation of, of rainwater cisterns. Uh, and this is more than rain barrels, by the way. This is the cistern that I installed in our house is 600 gallons, just to give you some point of comparison. Uh, many of the ones out in the Western cities like Tucson, they're up to a thousand or 2000 gallons of stormwater capture. Um, and, and you need to right size it according to how much, you know, the, the natural rainfall patterns in your area. But um, in Australia, more than 40% of the homes have, have aggressive rainwater capture programs and it's less than 5% in the U S. So again, you know, a lot of potential there to get off the potable water supply for outdoor use. Okay, click. Um, just, you know, a quick summary here. Um, what I see on the future horizon in the next decade or two, lots of room to run on conservation. We're gonna see huge increases in water recycling, water reuse, stormwater capture is coming on. Um, there's some leaders in the country like the city of Los Angeles, as I mentioned pricing um, becoming more and more uniformly used across the United States, the tiered rate structures, and eventually desalination, desalination for some cities. If you've maxed out on all these other things, um, like some cities have done in the Western US, then desal becomes, even though it's very expensive, it becomes a viable option or a desirable option um, once you've exhausted the potential of, of these other things. One last click, I think. Oh, um, maybe there's one more left. So I just wanted to mention this for those of you that work um, in municipal governments, uh, county level, uh, locality, you know, there was a very, very interesting program done by the Alliance for Water Efficiency, a nationwide um, water conservation, urban water conservation organization. And they created a model ordinance um, you can pull it off the shelf and then customize it to your local your your local municipality, um, and they call it Net Blue. And the the quick summary of this, the simple summary of this, is that basically what these policy ordinances say is that any new development, whatever the net increase in water use is going to be, um, commercial areas, residential areas, the developer of of those um, developments is going to be required to fully offset their water need by helping to subsidize um, these other water conservation measures in existing homes and businesses. So paying for toilet replacements, paying for installation of rainwater cisterns and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on this in, in the interest of time, but um, this might be of interest to a lot of you and it's equally applicable again across the United States and I think there's a lot of potential there for communities that really want to try to stabilize their water use um, in a sustainable manner going forward over the long term. Okay, now the last click. So um, that's what I have uh, for my presentation. There's my email address. If any of you want to follow up with me directly, please do. This is the one paper that we published at the end of last year, um, published in the international journal called Water. And uh, again, we have our new paper about the Colorado River utilities um, coming out hopefully within the next couple of months. So thank you. And I'm open and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Brian. It was uh, uh, really informative. Uh, I work in the water industry myself. So a lot of your topic is uh, it's pretty close to home. Um, we do have about 10 minutes for a question and answer. Uh, if you have something that you wanted to share about, um, with what you've just heard, please use the chat box uh, to submit your question or comment. Thanks, and we already have a few questions um, in the chat box. So the first one, um, speaking to rainwater harvesting, some of the Western states really restrict the amount of stormwater that you can harvest. So are you seeing, is there a change um, at the federal level, starting to loosen these restrictions so that we can actually, you know, increase the stormwater harvesting in the areas. Yeah, terrific question. Uh, spot on, and um, it really caught some news headlines a few years ago when it became um, evident that the state of Colorado uh, prohibited 
the use of rainwater capture um, because of the nature of the water rights system out there. So all water uses eventually are, are authorized through the issuance of a water rights, um, an entitlement to use a certain volume of water. Um, but the public outcry, the public backlash on that prohibition was so strong that the state backed off and said, you know, this is de minimis effect on total water supply um, you know, for other uses. And so they said, in fact, um, the argument was made that uh, by this rainwater capture is helping to reduce other problems with stormwater runoff, of course, which is overtaxing our, um, our, our uh, water collection systems. It's uh, eroding our local streams because of too much water getting in too quickly. It's causing us a lot of problems with having to invest in detention and retention uh, programs and that sort of thing. So they started to see that, look, there's actually a benefit here. There's a there's a public benefit to having residents capture some of their rainwater and putting it out in their outdoor landscaping. So it is an issue, um, but I think there's um, th there's a lot of movement and a lot of um, precedence for pushing back on that and getting the state to to back off of that at the state level. That is very excellent news. Um, another question, is there a good public facing version of that gallons per person map that uh, folks could see? Uh, you know, I'm very happy to share it with anybody who wants. Um, by the way, the data that should have had a note below the map, that data comes right out of the USGS five year water use accounting reports. Um, that was, as you saw, it was taken from 2015. Um, I believe that you can do that map for 2020 now. But basically, it was just taking for each of the counties where you had um, total public water supply reported at the county level, total water, public water supply or use at the county level, along with an estimate of the population within that county, reported through the USGS water use accounting reports. And so we just took the USGS data and created that map. So I'm happy to share it with you. You could recreate it your own if you wanted to access that data directly through USGS, but I'm very happy to provide it um, at my email address for anybody that's interested in those data. Not all, the, the reason there's a lot of blank spots in that map, by the way, is because there were many counties who did not report either the population or the public water supply um, use of water. Well, that's a good segue to the next question is that, is there something that we could do to encourage those localities to start either gathering the data or reporting it in some better accessible way? Oh boy, I love that question. Um, you know, after, go, you know, I, I, I could go on and on about how difficult and frustrating it was to collect this, these data from these water utilities. Um, we were pulling teeth. Um, and we were pulling out our own hair trying to get these data. And it's ridiculous that you have to go through a FOIA you know, process to get it out of some of these utilities. There really needs to be a mandate, and I believe it needs to be at the federal level, um, for reporting, for consistent reporting across the board. And that would be not just at the local water utility level, but also at the county level, um, appointed to county governments. And given all the interest in water and energy use in this country, it's ridiculous that we don't have some kind of federal standards, um, some consistency in that reporting so that all of us could do this kind of a study, you know, just by going online and downloading those data. Great. Um, are there any environmental concerns associated with the brine byproduct of desalinization? Yeah, Zach, thanks for the question. There certainly is. Um, I kind of skipped over it because I was trying to not overuse my time allocation, but thanks for asking. So I mentioned the problem with cost. So this process of desalinization is extremely electricity intensive and the electricity costs a lot. And so that water becomes expensive water. It's about 10 times more than, than other water supply sources like direct extractions of water out of a river or a groundwater aquifer. Um, but there are other problems. There are two other problems, Zach, that I'll highlight here. Um, one is the one that you bring up. So when you run a gallon of water through a desalination process, 
you end up with a half a gallon of fresh water and a half a gallon of very, very salty, concentrated brine solution. And you have to figure out how to dispose of that brine solution in an environmentally safe and appropriate manner. Now, if you're on the coast, uh, typically what's done is they run, so they're not only pulling water in to the plant from the ocean, but they then send another parallel pipe way out into the ocean with diffusers on it so that they diffusely um, disperse that brine solution back out in the ocean. Other more inland cities are doing it by pumping some of the brine back into um, saline aquifers, underground aquifers, as a way of disposing of it. But it's tough and it's, and it's restricted a lot of cities. That's an expensive process. You know, however, disposal of the brine is expensive. The one last thing, Zach, though, that I want to highlight here is because it's an energy intensive process, um, that has serious consequences for climate change, right? So whether you're doing desalinization or water reuse and water recycling, to the extent that we can get off of carbon emitting sources of energy to run those processes, um, the less, of course, that we're going to be impacting the climate and getting out of this vicious cycle of using fossil fuel energy sources to develop our water supply, which is changing our climate and affecting our water supply. So you got to get, we got to get out of this vicious, vicious cycle here. Thank you. Um, one last question that I have is, does this research hold true in suburban or rural environments, or are you seeing this trend in just kind of the urban city um, landscapes? Are there additional challenges that might present itself in the suburban and rural environment? It's a really good question, Liz. It's really pertinent to this study that we're working on on the Colorado River uh, utilities right now. Um, there tends to be a much stronger success within the urban um, who are on, you know, the public distribution systems in particular. Uh, much stronger success with 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 reducing or stabilizing their water use. Um, there's a real issue with with unincorporated areas that are out in kind of suburbia. Um, the outskirts of Phoenix, for example, or, you know, Las Vegas, um, because they're not under sort of a central distribution system, they're not under the same control or influence of a water utility or a water authority. And so it's been harder to get them um, to move, you know, in the right direction. Um, and also going back, Liz, to the point I made earlier about there is a difference. And we're going to we're going to analyze further analyze and, and write about this in our paper between small and large. So the smaller you are, if you're out in the suburbs, you know, it's going to be, if there is any sort of a water youth, water authority or water utility out there, they're tending to be smaller. Um, they probably don't have a full-time water conservation person on staff. Um, and contrast that with places like San Antonio, Texas, which has full-time staff of more than 30 people working on water conservation alone. So, so not not surprisingly, we do see a difference um, between small and large. Great question. Great. Thank you. Well, I think that concludes our session. So I'll turn it back to you, James. Oh, thanks, Liz. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, wonderful presentation, a lot of uh, great content and uh, response uh, to our questions. Uh, we really also wanted to express our appreciation for you to serve as our keynote speaker for today pleasure. Thank, thanks for the invitation. Certainly. Uh, our next presentation is by uh, Aaron Porter on spatial and temporal patterns in stream flow, water chemistry, and benthic macroinvertebrates of the streams of Fairfax County. Uh, I actually come from Fairfax County, so uh, this presentation is uh, pretty exciting for me. Uh, Aaron is a hydrologist and project chief for the U U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, he works at the Virginia and West Virginia Water Science Center in Richmond. Aaron has been involved in a wide variety of USGS water resource investigations since 2014. His primary focus has been in utilizing stream flow and continuous water quality monitoring data. The goal of his work is to improve the our understanding of nutrient and sediment dynamics in and loadings from small urban watersheds. Aaron currently oversees long-term monitoring efforts in urban streams in Fairfax County, Hampton Roads, Salem, Roanoke, 
Reston, where I come from actually, and Ashland. So the USGS would like to expand its effort in urban streams throughout Virginia. And Aaron uh, recorded his presentation prior to today's conference and we will view it now. All right, well, uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Aaron Porter. I'm an hydrologist with the US, uh, USGS Virginia and West Virginia uh, Water Science Center located uh, right here in Richmond. Uh, so today I'm gonna be discussing our long-term urban monitoring program in Fairfax County. Um, but before I get going on all that, I just want to thank you all for, for accommodating this virtual presentation. Um, so I've got a a pregnant wife at home who is due any day now. So I'm just trying to stay nearby. Um, so I appreciate the accommodation. Um, before I get into the details of the program, I'll first just set the stage for why Fairfax County has joined up with USGS to conduct this work. Um, so first off, you know, as is, is the case in most urban suburban areas, uh, Fairfax County streams are suffering from many of the common symptoms of urban stream syndrome, such as um, stress to aquatic communities, stream erosion, increased sedimentation and nutrient loading, and flooding issues. Um, in response to these issues, the county has made significant investments um, to improve the health of these streams um, and has done this to comply with, of course, local, state, and federal regulations and TMDLs, uh, such as the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. Um, since 2009, they've invested over $100 million on an array of watershed management implementations um, and our monitoring is being used to detect changes in various stream health metrics um, in response to these implementations. And we're doing this to provide it, the insight um, you know, into how to best direct future investments. So monitoring began uh, back in 2007, um, and the study objectives can best be described in, in two ongoing phases. Uh, so number one is just to generate long-term monitoring data to describe basic water quality conditions, uh, compute trends, compute nutrient and sediment yields, um, and monitor stream health um, using benthic macroinvertebrate community metrics. Uh, the first phase is the bedrock of this program, and it is ongoing to this day. Um, so we're almost to, 20, to uh, 15 years now. Um, but these data are also used to satisfy the second objective. Uh, which is to transfer what we've learned to less intensively monitor watersheds and also to evaluate um, relations between the observed conditions in a combination of things like BMP implementations, um, public works infrastructure, uh, changes in land use and land cover, and changes in climate. So our approach to monitoring is based on two tiers of monitoring intensity. Um, and the network consists of, of 20 stations of both, um, five of which are what we call intensively monitored, uh, which are the blue triangles on the map. So at those stations, we're collecting continuous measurements of stream flow and water quality parameters, and we're utilizing um, automatic samplers to collect nutrient and sediment storm samples. We refer to the other 15 stations as trend sites. Um, those are the red triangles, and at these locations, we collect continuous water level data, um, and each month we visit the sites to collect nutrient and sediment uh, grab samples um, and water quality parameters. Um, so these sites are primarily used to compute trends in water quality constituents. And then at all 20 of the sites, um, Fairfax County ecologists collect benthic macroinvertebrate samples biannually um, in the spring and the fall. And just to note, these, these 20 watersheds range in size from around one to five square miles. Um, and the county spans three unique physiographic regions. Um, so the coastal plain to the east, the Piedmont through the center and the majority of the county, and a sub-province of the Piedmont, which is the Triassic lowlands to the west. Um, and this is important because these uh, unique features of these geologic terrains um, can affect water quality and stream flow. Um, okay, so now I want to share some data analyses that were presented in our most recent publication back in 2020. Um, so we conducted a comprehensive analysis of stream flow characteristics across the network that included uh, metrics like base flow separations, um, 
flow duration curves, annual exceedance probabilities, um, <clears throat> precipitation runoff relations, uh, stream flashiness, um, and trends in stream flow. Uh, given the limited time today, I thought it, this would be a nice figure to share because it, it really encapsulates, sorry, encapsulates um, how hydrology has changed in the county over, um, over the long term. So what I'm showing here are two long-term stream gauges that are not actually part of the monitoring network. Um, they're part of the Chesapeake Bay Untitled network um, that many of you are probably uh, aware of. And um, they're both in within the county of Fairfax um, and are operated by my team. Um, they have records dating back uh, to the 1940s. For each site, I'm presenting the base flow index, so the percentage of flow from groundwater discharges and the runoff ratio, which is the percentage of precipitation uh, that ran, runs directly overland to the stream. Uh, for both of these sites, we see that the base flow index has steadily declined over time, and the runoff ratio has increased. Now, this is, this is a classic response to developmental pressure. Um, so more impervious cover, more channelization, you know, it's going to decrease groundwater infiltration and consequently lead to increases in runoff. Um, so the results are lower base flows that are needed to sustain aquatic life and higher peak flows, which is, of course, going to increase erosion. So now let's look at uh, specific conductance, um, because stream salinization is a very important concern, getting a lot of attention right now. Um, and we spend a good deal of time focusing on, on this subject in our report. So. Um, in this first plot to the left, we see variability across both sites and seasons. I have all 20 sites here, and I've split the data into two seasons. So the cool season is denoted by the blue box plot for each site and the warm uh, by the red. So the takeaway here is that across all sites, um, SC was higher in the cool months and significantly higher in the Triassic lowland sites and the Piedmont or the coastal plain sites. Um, also important to mention, conductance was higher in watersheds with high impervious cover. Um, and this was especially true in the cool season, the cool months. Um, so, you know, we have seasonal differences. Um, we have differences across an impervious gradient, and we have differences across physiographic uh, regions. On this next figure, I'm showing the conductance flow relation for the five intensively monitored stations. So um, those sites with the continuous um, 15 minute data. Um, and for each site, I'm showing the warm season on the left and the cool season on the right. Um, now, conductance, you know, typically is going to decrease with increasing stream flow as relatively high conductance groundwater becomes diluted by relatively low precipitation runoff. Um, and this is clearly the case in the warm season, which you're going to show on the left of this figure. But on the right side, we see or we can find that conductance um, in many cases actually increases with flow. And this occurs in the winter months when de-icing salts are applied to the roadways and then are washed off during snow melt, uh, periods of snow melt or subsequent rain events. So in keeping with, with conductance for a moment, um, I'm presenting the trends across the network here. So on the map, you can see the upward facing orange triangles indicating increasing trends in, in SC across the network. Um, and in the bar chart to the left, it's the average annual percent change at each station. So conductance increased by about two and a half percent per year on average, which equates out to about a seven and a half unit per year increase. And the largest increase has occurred in watersheds with the most impervious cover. Um, and these trends are, again, likely related to increased use of road salts and then the increased delivery of those salts to streams by um, increased overland runoff. So one more slide on conductance here. Um, so the, the trend method that we employed allows not only to, uh, to not only calculate the long term annual trend, but also the annual trend with within each month. Um, you know, so, for example, how has conductance, specific conductance changed over 10 years in the month of January versus the month of February versus March and so on. Um, and interestingly, we found that the significant increases at these stations were um, most consistently observed in the spring and the fall months, not actually in the winter uh, when the de-icing salts were being applied. Um, so this suggests that the salt that's 
that's being applied is hanging around in the environment and being conveyed to the streams by subsequent events. Um, so, you know, in other words, the soil may be uh, quite saturated with these salts. Um, you know, so in the springtime, spring storms are going to convey that salt that's applied the previous winter. And in the fall, you know, we typically have droughts in the mid Atlantic region. Um, so you, you get older groundwater discharging to streams, and that may contain chloride that's um, slowly moved downward toward, you know, through the soil matrix over time. Um, or, or perhaps remobilization of, of salt storages by those large fall storms like uh, hurricanes and tropical storms. All right, so I'll transition now to discuss some of the things we learned about phosphorus. Um, we first of all, we found that concentrations were significantly higher in the Triassic lowland sites than these other um, two physiographic regions. Uh, phosphorus concentrations were also seasonally dependent, um, so we observed higher concentrations in the warm months and the cool months. Um, and we attributed this primarily to two factors, and they're kind of inter interwoven factors. So, uh, first off, we have the the depend, uh, temperature dependent release of orthophosphate from sediments. Um, so in other words, orthophosphate is released at a, at a greater rate in, in warmer waters. Um, so that's important to keep in mind as we consider the effects of climate change. Um, number two, which again is, is kind of related to one, uh, dissolved oxygen concentrations are at their lowest in the summer months. Um, and these, con these, uh, these conditions can cause uh, these phosphorus ions to disassociate from the metals and the organic matter um, that they were previously bound to. Now on the right, uh, I'm presenting the phosphorus stream flow relation uh, for each of these five intensively monitored sites. Um, and we see that phosphorus concentrations increase with flow um, and the composition of the total phosphorus also, also changes. Um, so the compositional change is indicated by the color change in, the, in those points, uh, which signals a shift from dissolved P um, as lower flow at lower flows to particulate bound P at higher flows. And the the increase in total phosphorus um, with flow highlights that dominance of particulate bound uh, phosphorus in these watersheds. So phosphorus mobilization is closely tied to sediment mobilization. Um, now, bouncing back to our trend analysis, so phosphorus increased in most streams, um, but those trends were only significant at four sites. So that's at Captain Hickory, Castle Creek, uh, Indian Run, and Paul Spring Bridge, uh, where you see the orange bars and the triangle, orange triangles. Um, and concentrations actually decreased at Frog Branch, which, um, by the way, is the site at which we measure the highest median concentration over this time period. So that's very good to see. Um, why that is, we're still working to figure out. Uh, it's important to point out that phosphorus levels were generally low, um, and these increases were only about 0 0.01 milligrams per liter, uh, but they were primarily due to increases in orthophosphate. Um, and though, you know, that's very low, that's still an important finding because um, small increases in orthophosphate can have, of course, very significant impacts on stream health since they are a key limiting nutrient in these freshwater streams. All right, so now on to nitrogen. Um, so over this 10-year period, uh, we see a generally positive picture um, with decreasing concentrations mixed with a few sites showing increases. Um, in our regional trend analysis, which, which basically just leverages all the data from all the sites, um, what we found was we found total nitrogen um, hasn't really changed much. Um, but this is because of increasing trends in nitrate are being offset by decreasing uh, trends in the organic component. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're seeing increasing trends at a few of these sites. Um, the two I want to make note of are at South Fork Little Difficult Run, uh, where total nitrogen and nitrate both increased, and then Captain Hickory Run, um, where TN uh, didn't increase, you know, statistically speaking, but, but nitrate did. Um, and both of those are both of those watersheds are sub-basins of the difficult run watershed. Um, so for those of you that are familiar with Fairfax County, um, you know, that, that is a watershed that's been very well studied by, by a number of different researchers over the last 10, 15 years. An important factor um, that those two watersheds have in common are a very high density of septic system infrastructure. Um, those systems show up, so the septic systems show up on the map 
um, here as the brown dots. And this relation, um, you know, it has been linked to, to higher interesting nitrate concentrations in um, not only in this study, but in several other studies of difficult run, the difficult run watershed as well. And in the bottom right, I'm showing a regression of median nitrate concentration and septic density. Um, and while, you know, the relation isn't perfect, uh, we can see that there is a pretty strong correlation between these two variables. Um, but, you know, caveat, you know, there are obviously other, you know, important driving forces um, in the county affecting in-stream nitrate, like point source discharges, um, fertilizer inputs, um, and also very likely variability in soil denitrification potential. So we computed annual loads of sediment, phosphorus, and nitrogen constituents. Um, so both the totals and the subcomponents of the dissolved and particulate uh, components at the five intensively monitored watersheds. Um, you know, given time constraints here, I'm just going to share a little bit about the sediment and phosphorus loads. So uh, what we're seeing here are the, the cumulative yields, so the area normalized loading rate um, over the over this study period, this 10 year period. Um, so the first thing to note is that difficult run and South Fork Little Difficult, which are the, the blue and the green lines, um, and I remember are the two sub uh, watersheds in the greater, the, the greater difficult run watershed, um, these two yielded substantially more sediment than the others over this 10 year period. Um, looking at the next, the, the bottom um, pane, uh, you know, given what we know about elevated phosphorus concentrations in the Triassic lowlands, um, it wasn't a surprise to find that Flatlick Branch, um, which is the orange line, um, yielded substantially more phosphorus than the other watersheds. So this, this is the only uh, of the five continuous intensively monitored watersheds that is in the, the Triassic Lowlands. Now I've brought in those red, uh, the red ovals here to highlight the effect of intense storm events on sediment. Um, and, and on phosphorus loadings, which you can see in these major step increases um, that occurred during the, the three largest storm events um, that occurred over this time period, that was these 10 years. Um, and it, you know, it's really shocking that, for example, at South Fork Little Difficult, um, which again is the green line. So if we look at the green line on the top pane, 60% um, of the sediment load generated over that entire 10 year period at South Fork Little Difficult was generated from only three storm events. Um, and so, you know, that of course is going to have some direct management implications, um, you know, when considering how to manage this watershed to, to reduce sediment load. All right, so for anyone familiar with the turbidity streamflow hysteresis analysis, um, You'll know that those relations can be used to infer, you know, the source of sediment loadings to a stream, uh, at least can, can be one line of evidence. Um, so what I'm presenting here is a cross correlation analysis um, that we use to explore hysteresis patterns across many storms simultaneously, um, determine, you know, whether or not there's a pattern occurring at that site or across sites. So if you think about a time series plot of both just flow and turbidity um, during a storm like the one uh, to the right, you know, they don't always peak at the same time. So when per turbidity peaks before stream flow, um, that's suggestive of a source of sediment that's nearby the stream or nearby the monitoring station, such as from um, the stream bed or the lower banks. Um, and in the main figure here, um, that's going to express itself as a little blue dot that is falling to the or tailing to the right. Now, if turbidity peaks after flow, like in the bottom left, um, then that tells us sources may be further away from the monitoring point, um, such as in the floodplain or in the upland areas of the watershed. So it takes longer to get there. And that expresses itself in the, in the main figure here as values that are tailing to the left. So uh, we ran this analysis on a select number of storms in each of these watersheds and found that um, most of the values peaked within one hour of stream flow. You know, so that tells us that in general, uh, across these five sites, sediment is, is really well correlated to stream flow. So as, as flow increases, so does sediment transport. That makes sense. Um, but we also see some spatial variability here. So 
a difficult run and at Flatwick Branch, um, the values in some of these storms have a tendency to tail to the right. And that's suggestive that, that the source may be, you know, within the stream channel, like um, uh, mobilization of bed material or scour of, of the lower banks. Um, and it's mobilized on the on the rising limb of the storm. Um, but at South Fork, a little difficult, Dead Run and Long Branch, the three other watersheds here, um, there are more storms in which the, the values are tailing to the left, um, suggesting that transport here is from floodplains or in the upland areas. Um, so now I'm shifting gears away from water chemistry. Um, and here we have results from our trend analyses of 20 benthic macroinvertebrate metrics. Um, and these metrics, even more than our, our nutrient sediment and water quality parameters, um, can give us a, an indication of stream health. Um, because these insects have to you know, actually live and survive in these streams. Um, you know, I've heard on a numerous occasions, heard them called uh, living recorders um, because of their relative, relative immobility, um, you know, and because they're, they're variable sensitivity to, to different stressors. Um, now, the big takeaway message from this analysis is that the changes that we observed in our 20 benthic metric uh, metrics suggest that um, the condition and the function and the biodiversity of streams in Fairfax County is improving. Um, but many of these improvements are from a greater number of organisms that are tolerant of urban stressors. Uh, so, you know, instead of going back to where we were pre-development, you know, perhaps we're establishing a new, a new urban normal. So just to quickly walk through this figure, I'll highlight a few, a few important um, areas here. Um, I'll, I'll say first that these are these are trend results at the network scale. So this is trends that are incorporating data from all of our 20 sites, uh, or sorry, all of our 14 sites that had a long enough record to, to conduct trends on. And we find that the um, the total number of unique species has increased. Um, but as I mentioned, much of the of the gain was from our more tolerant organisms, um, many of which fall into this cotin metric. So most people are familiar with EPT, um, which is used to measure the more pollutant, um, pollution sensitive organisms. Um, well, Cote incorporates um, the mayflies and the caddisflies from EPT, um, but includes the, the odonates, so the dragonflies, and the uh, coleroptera, um, the beetles, um, that are more tolerant of urban environments, since you know, many um, urban streams just can't support uh, plecropterans, um, you know, the stoneflies. We also found that the Fairfax IBI increased. Um, so most sites went from this quality of store, score of, of poor to fair, um, and some from fair to good. And the change in IBI was, was not only, but largely driven by a decrease in dominance. Um, so the community became less homogenous um, due to a, a decrease in the, the, the very utmost tolerant organisms. Um, all right, so the previous slide was a quick summary of the benthic analyses as it pertains to the network-wide trends, obviously leveraging all of the data together from all sites, but we also performed all these analyses for each individual station, um, and those analyses yielded some, some pretty interesting results. So now in this figure, I'm presenting the, uh, the trend lines for the Fairfax County IBI, and an interesting takeaway here can be seen by comparing Castle Creek and South Fork for the difficult. Um, so the trends at South Fork Little Difficult, which is the blue line, are similar to the most sites in the network, and they show um, moderate recovery, you know, following uh, many decades of disturbance. Uh, meanwhile, the conditions at Castle Creek, which is the least developed watershed in the network, uh, were initially the best in the network and had an IBI score in the excellent range, um, much like a reference site. but. Uh, due to some development in that watershed, um, the abundance of more tolerant organisms increased. And IBI is showing um, a non-significant but declining path. Um, and it was accompanied by um, significant declines in the percent EPT, um, which again is the most sensitive taxa. Um, and it increases in the more tolerant taxa. Uh, another interesting note is that the sites with a better starting condition at the beginning of the study were more likely to decline over that period, um, likely to develop no pressures, um, you know, whereas sites with poor, very poor spores were more likely to improve um, as they began to stabilize, you know, after some intense disruption in the previous decades. All right, so 
Um, running out of time here, but I presented some of the, the results from the first 10 years of monitoring. Uh, but I mentioned at the top that we want to link what we have, what we've learned um, at each of these monitoring stations to changes throughout the watershed, um, you know, in order to help the county meet their water quality goals. Um, so we ask ourselves, you know, what is driving the response we have observed over the last 10 years? Um, and conceptually, we can think of this, um, think of think about this like, um, you know, we know that nutrients increase or decrease from changing inputs, um, or they may be affected by changes in land use and land cover. Uh, but we know that the county has heavily invested in BMP practices to reduce those loads and has received credit for those measures. Um, we know the changes in climate may alter nutrient availability. And of course, we know that there are unidentified drivers that we haven't even thought of or simply can't measure. And we put this framework together to better understand our observed water quality response. So we're currently working on a report uh, scheduled to be published sometime next year that attempts to link the reach scale changes um, that I've discussed today to watershed scale changes um, in the landscape. And I'm showing some, some quick snapshots of those analyses here. I'm not gonna go into any depth here, but um, for example, we've summarized uh, all the management practices implemented throughout the county and their expected credit reductions. Uh, we're investigating um, changes in the magnitude and timing of storm flow responses uh, that might be caused by changes in the landscape or um, BMP implementations. We've summarized changes in land use, land cover, wastewater infrastructure, population, um, you know, other similar factors that may affect change. And we're using uh, published rates of source inputs along with our computed loads, I think mass balance. Um, to better understand the, the faint transport of nutrients throughout these watersheds and, of course, much more. So um, I hope that gives everyone a good idea of the absolute and just absolute wealth of data we've collected in Fairfax County um, and the analyses that we're conducting to, you know, to better understand um, the changing conditions in these streams. I'll just say long-term urban environment programs like this are, are relatively rare. Um, so, you know, we run a few others out of the, our office, um, such as in Hampton Roads and in Roanoke. Um, but in general, urban watersheds are relatively understudied. Um, you know, so I think programs uh, like these have a great value. And, and we are always looking forward, looking for opportunities, um, you know, to partner with state and local jurisdictions to, to implement additional monitoring efforts. Um, so with that, um, thanks so much for your time. And again, for putting up with this, this virtual presentation. I think that was a, a very informative uh, video. Um, I believe Aaron is with us today. So if there's any questions that you uh, have uh, on the uh, presentation, uh, please put them in the chat box in the lower right hand corner of the screen. Do we have any uh, questions or comments yet, Liz? Yeah, we have a few questions. Um, comment on excellent data and do these uh, general trends hold true in other urban areas of Virginia, or does it vary by locality? Um, first of all, thanks everyone for for uh, listening in and listening to yourself give a presentation is extremely awkward. <laughs> uh, so I I had recorded that because I was worried I might my wife might go in later and I might not be here for this, but uh, I got to listen to myself. Um, so hard to answer that question. We run. A number of other networks, as I mentioned, um, those networks are not as mature as this one, and we like to have at least 10 years of data before we start looking into trends because that kind of cuts through. Um, we think of 10 years as kind of cutting through that uh, climate variability. We get you know wet years, dry years, average years. Um, so I don't have the data to answer that for urban settings. Um, we do see we, we do run um, a number of stations that are part of the Chesapeake Bay um, non-tidal network, which is used for the the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay watershed model and the TMDL. Uh, these are not really analogous um, watersheds. They're they're far far bigger um, and generally non-urban, um, so the results don't really uh, align as much. But uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that's something we want to be able to answer. You know, over the next five years or so. Great. 
Um, and just one more question. When looking at benthic macroinvertebrates, do the patterns suggest that there needs to be a re-evaluation in the metrics used to evaluate ecological health versus pollution tolerance? Uh, so I always get questions about the benthic stuff, which and, and I appreciate it. I'm not an ecologist, so take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, really focus more on hydrology. So we did partner with um, folks in the county to do those analyses. But um, I think a big takeaway from this is that when an urban jurisdiction, um, city, county is using an IBI to you know to assess, or some regulate regulatory body is using an IBI to assess uh, the condition of those streams. Um, it's really inappropriate to, I think, to use uh, a larger scale, you know, regional IBI, um, something that's not well calibrated towards an urban setting. Um, you know, comparing urban streams to reference streams, it's they're always going to be poor or very poor um, urban streams, no matter what you do. Um, based on our work, our research has led us to believe they'll never get back to anywhere near that reference condition. Um, so I'm not sure if that's exactly the question or answering that question exactly, but um, the Fairfax IBI, I mentioned the, the Cote metric, you know, the, the IBI is a, compare, is, a, is a combination of many of the different metrics that I'd showed in, in that bar plot, um, but it is tailored or tweaked, I guess, towards um, what is realistic within an urban stream. Gotcha, thanks. And one final question, when will your report be available? So the the report that this presentation some, or attempted to summarize is available um, and I can put a link. Uh, I'm not sure if, if I enter a chat, does everyone see that? Um, yep, you I can, can select everyone and okay. send it to everyone. I can um, give a link out to this report. Um, at the end of the talk, I alluded to another report um, that is trying to explain change, uh, explain why we're seeing what we're seeing. I think that's going to be um, a really, a really interesting report, kind of summarizing all these um, these changes. That is not published yet, but I expect it to be available online in uh, around April or May of next year. Great. Well, I uh, appreciate you uh, giving this wonderful presentation, making a great video. And I've done that myself, given a, a video and then sit in the audience. And that is kind of an odd sensation. Mm -hmm. um, we'll now take a break for a few minutes. Uh, if there, take a chance to stretch your legs, get something to uh, eat or drink, and check your email. I know my email inbox is blowing up. Um, and we will restart promptly at 1045. Uh, please be back by that time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Christian. She's uh, be talking about conservation efforts in Virginia. Uh, Mara works for the Virginia Association for Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Uh, she is the assistant coordinator for the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program called VCAP. She's worked for the association for two years. Previously, Mara uh, worked for a nonprofit in the city of Richmond. There she provided environmental education experiences to students in the Richmond City Public School System. Mara is a graduate of Elton University. Welcome, Mara. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, like James said, my name is Mara Christian, and I'm with the Virginia Association of Soil Water Conservation Districts. I'll call it the association today just for time's sake. Um, but I am specifically a part of the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program. I'm the assistant coordinator, and I work with Kevin McLean, who is the coordinator for the program. I'm really happy to be here today to, with this group. Um, it's relatively new to me, um, but I did attend a webinar this past couple months um, about environmental justice through um, stormwater lens, and that was fantastic. So I'm thrilled to be here today to learn from other panelists and um, present as well. So my focus today is kind of to give all of you an overview of what the um, what Virginia soil water conservation districts do, and then kind of focus on how we promote conservation at various different levels um, with Virginia's different kinds of landscapes. I'm going to turn my video off if that's okay. Um, and you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so just an overview of what uh, what soil water conservation districts do. If you're not familiar, um, the United States, each state has their own set of soil water conservation districts. Um, we're a part of a national association of conservation districts. And you can see on this map, 
Um, this is Virginia's 47 districts. Some are single counties, some have multiple counties or cities involved, um, but that's kind of an, a layout of what our state looks like. And um, I work at the association. We're located in Mechanicsville, just outside of Richmond. And we, um, we're a nonprofit organization and we oversee and coordinate programs and promote conservation um, for, for um, each of our 47 soil water conservation districts and um, provide leadership and um, just coordinate efforts statewide. And we work with a bunch of local and state partners. We certainly wouldn't be able to do any of our work without all of their assistance. And so while we at the association um, coordinate programs and help advocate for local needs, um, the local districts that you can see in this map are the ones who are out in the community, boots on the ground, um, working with their um, their constituents and um, really putting conservation on the ground. So the association really coordinates programs and I'll talk through um, some of the programs that we do today. And I will say that though I will touch on a bunch of the programs that the association works and coordinates on, I will focus a bit more on the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program, VCAP. Um, that's what I, I work on personally, and I think is the most relevant to this group and the water quality efforts that you all um, do out in your communities. So you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so here's just kind of some photos um, that kind of showcase the theme I wanted to touch on today, which is promoting conservation across Virginia's different kinds of landscapes. Um, these are actually photos that we just received um, from our photo contest that we hold each year. So you've got you've got your um, coastal communities, your rural mountainous areas, um, and then our urban communities. So we've got a lot of different people and landscapes that we work with, which is wonderful. Um, I think we can all agree that conservation is important in all those different um, times, types of landscapes. And I will touch on um, that soil water conservation, conservation districts um, were formed back in the Dust Bowl. Um, so originally the intent of the districts was to work with primarily agricultural property owners and um, do education work associated with um, those kind of um, landowners. And as Virginia has grown and urbanized, you know, we have many more impervious surfaces in the ground than we did years ago. Um, we've kind of broadened our outreach to newer audiences with programs such as the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program. Um, and that is, yeah, we're excited to be able to um, offer opportunities to all of Virginia's property owners and get conservation in the ground. And, you know, all this to say that all of these are important as we get near our water, our WIP goals, our watershed implementation plan goals. Um, 2025 is coming up and we um, have a lot of work to do to get um, our water quality improved and meet those um, TMDL goals that we have set along with other states in the Bay Area. So I'll say that the WIP goals are at the forefront of our attention and um, I'm sure for all of you as well. So next slide, please. So here is just, um, I wanted to kind of do an overview of what district just districts offer to their um, communities. And I'll say that there's kind of a three areas of work that I would um, categorize district work as, and that would be um, technical support and implementing our cost share programs that I'll talk about here soon. Um, education work, and that's with students um, in and out of schools, adults, and then the third category would be just general outreach and programming associated with conservation. So those are the three areas of work that districts really do and they are experts at the local community and also work with many local partners at the same time. Um, so on the technical side of things that I'll talk through, um, we, we at the association work very closely with the Department of Conservation and Recreation and other state partners as well um, in implementing programs that um, prevent pollution from entering our watershed and improving soil quality. So the, the Virginia Agricultural Cost Share Program and Virginia Conservation Assistance Program are our two main technical programs um, that we work to get practices into the ground that I'll showcase soon um, and education work as well. But I'll say that each district kind of operates differently and has their own um, programs that they implement. So for example, um, districts will work with their localities on erosion and sediment control ordinances, um, doing formal conservation plans, and lots of other local initiatives that we could talk all day about all the great work that um, local soil water conservation districts do. And I was thinking of some that may be of interest to this group. Um, and these are not to say that they're, these don't happen in other areas of the state, but um, Henrico County with their Henricopolis Soil Water Conservation District has a HAWKS program, which is Henrico Water Quality Samplers. Um, and they, uh, Stacey Heflin, who I believe is on this committee, um, coordinates that program and um, coordinates volunteers that do um, water monitoring in the county, which is wonderful. And other other um, districts do that kind of work as well. That's just an example. 
Um, districts also do something we call MIWI education, which is meaningful watershed environmental education. Um, and they teach elementary students about and some middle school students about watersheds and the importance of keeping um, those clean and how pollution really um, comes about. You know, for rain barrel workshops, hazardous waste collection events, native plant sales, all of these wonderful things that districts do. So if you aren't aware of your local soil water conservation district, I encourage you to reach out to them or just um, look them up on their, look their website or Facebook page. Um, I think they could be really beneficial to the work you all do um, and, you know, opportunities for partnership and all of that. And then just in case anyone's curious, the background of this photo is um, one of the practices that we installed through VCAP in Henrico County it actually just was installed. Um, it's a conservation landscaping project with a condo association. So it's a, a beautiful planting with um, native plants on the water. Next slide, please. I did want to touch on just briefly um, some of the legislative outreach advocacy that the association does. Um, this is the executive director, Dr. Kendall Tyree's area of expertise. So I won't spend too much time on it, but I did want to kind of throw some partners out there and just say that a big part of the association's work um, is advocating for district needs. Um, and we do off season outreach. This year had been mostly virtual, which is wonderful. We could still do that. Um, and then lobbying efforts, General Assembly. And you can see on this slide, there are countless partners that we work with and represent just goes to show that, you know, nothing gets done alone and we all are working to promote conservation in the Commonwealth. And it wouldn't be possible without these partners to um, help us get funding for the programs we offer and just educate the public on the great work and needs of our, our, um, our state. Next slide, please. Another big part of the association, um, and we also have an education founding foundation as part of the association um, is our education programming. And these are just three programs that we oversee at the association. Um, actually, Bonnie Mall is our education coordinator here. So she is the one who runs this, runs these programs and is a contact person. I've got her information later if, if this is of interest to you. Um, but again, these are coordinated by the foundation and they, um, we work very closely with local district staff to implement these programs um, and work with students. So we have um, top right, Dominion, Envi Dominion Energy and Biothon competition. It's a natural resource competition for high school students and um, teams are created with high schools or groups associated with high schools and they compete and take tests on topics like uh, forestry, aquatics, uh, things like that. And we actually st send a team to the international competition each year. So um, we have local competitions that make their way up to the national international level and that is a really great program students get lots of hands-on experiences they do um, water quality work as well so i think that if you know students who have interests that you maybe work with in volunteer groups um, consider letting them know about the environment program um, we also have youth conservation camp which is also for high schoolers um, it's a really hands-on awesome camp that's held each year in the summer um, at virginia tech and you can just see in those photos um, how fun it looks they get to be outside and and explore lots of different natural resource topics and um, have a blast. And we also have our Youth Conservation Leadership Institute, which again is another really great opportunity for folks on this call who maybe work with students who have really strong passion for conservation or a topic in specific. Um, through that Leadership Institute, they would work with the cohort of students and um, explore a topic of their choice with the natural resource um, focus, and they'll get to pair with a mentor and get to really di dive deep into um, projects in their high school experience that would really propel them forward to hopefully a um, profession in natural resources. So if you have you know, interest in any of these programs, please go to our website or reach out to Bonnie Mall. Um, we also have scholarships available for students, so lots of opportunities to get folks involved. And if you have interest in being a mentor or um, a coach for a virathon, all those things are wonderful. And yeah, please reach out. Um, next slide, please. Um, so now I'll transition into the more technical work that districts do. Um, and this is the Virginia Agricultural Cost Share Program, or FACS. And this is really the bread and butter program for what soil water conservation districts do. And it's very successful in Virginia. Um, it's a partnership between the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation and our Association of Soil Water Conservation Districts. And again, um, it is implemented at the local level through local districts. And um, this is one of the programs where we can offer financial assistance for um, agricultural conservation projects or BMPs, best management practices for ag operations. 
So that could be, you know, cropland, pasture land, forest land, all of those um, ag properties. And we can offer financial assistance that can really um, re reduce the cost significantly for projects. And these are really um, important to our Commonwealth and the Chesapeake Bay watershed and other watersheds of Virginia as well in meeting our watershed implementation plan goals. Um, ag BMPs are a huge part of uh, meeting those goals. So this is a really important program for, for Virginia. And not only benefits, you know, our water quality, but it, it um, benefits the farmers and the ag operations as well by reducing erosion, um, improving their nutrients on site, um, improving their yields of crops. So it's a really wonderful program. Next slide, please. And this is a program that um, I work for at the association. It complements the, the VAX program very well. Um, this is the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program, or VCAP. Um, it is for you know, non-ag property owners um, who are eligible to apply for this. We try our best not to call it an urban program because that's not accurate. Um, it's a program for really non-ag eligible property owners. So urban, suburban, or rural properties could be eligible for the program. As you can see in the slide, um, it is a cost share program and we are able to provide financial incentives, um, technical assistance and educational assistance to property owners to install stormwater control practices, or um, we call them stormwater BMPs. I never want to assume that anyone knows what a BMP is. There's so much jargon in this world that I just want to be, um, make sure everyone's on the same page when we're talking about this. Um, so it started as a pilot program in 2011, so it's a relatively new program in, the, in my world, in the soil water conservation district world. Um, it really has taken off running and became a formalized program in 2016. Um, originally was only eligible for um, property owners to apply within the Chesapeake Bay watershed portion of Virginia. It has since um, thankfully been expanded so the entire state of Virginia is eligible. Um, only areas in eligible in participating soil water conservation districts are able to apply. Um, I forgot to mention earlier there are areas of the state that are not covered by a soil water conservation district and that just goes back to when they were first formed during the Dust Bowl um, and you know they just didn't fall under the jurisdiction of of a soil water district, so that's still the case today, but we are working on getting um, all those areas of state covered and so they're able to participate. So um, this program um, is a program we can provide financial reimbursement for the 12 BMPs you can see here on the slide. Um, each of those has their own specifications that have to be met, and um, we have a, a large manual that kind of outlines what we need to see for these projects to be able to be um, given funding for, and they have a 10-year maintenance agreement that goes along with it. A voluntary program, just like VAX, um, so it kind of, it's the homeowner's project or the property owner's project, um, and they get to kind of decide what works best for them and if it if it makes sense to be um, installed on their property. And um, it's an application process. We meet, I, me and the steering committee meet monthly to review applications, and those applications are submitted by local soil water conservation districts. So. If you or someone you work with um, is interested, reaching out to your local soil water conservation district is the first place to start in the process of determining if VCAP um, could assist a property. Um, everyone always wants to know what kind of financial assistance we can offer. Um, so in general, we can cover up to 75% of the costs for these projects with set caps. So for um, the more vegetative practices like conservation landscaping or rain gardens, we can provide up to $3,500 and the more engineered and structural they get, we can um, reimburse for up to ten dollars to $15,000. So that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of um, costs. So if you compare VCAP to the VAX program, um, our projects are much smaller scale. We target mostly residential properties, but also there's other properties as well that are eligible, and as long as they're not state or federally funded properties. Um, but we are looking at smaller scale, smaller scale projects. And the goal, just like VAX, is to um, meet our water quality goals and improve Virginia's waterways. So we specifically look at nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment reductions, um, and then looking to reduce the quantity of stormwater kind of running off and um, overwhelming our waterways. So I think Brian's discussion this morning was a really great segue for this, talking about rainwater harvesting. That's one of the projects that we can provide cost share for, and one of our popular um, projects that we can fund. Um, it makes a huge difference in just the amount of stormwater that's running off properties. And again, the WIP goals, I've already talked about it a couple of times, but are a huge motivator for us. Um, we 
submit all of these projects to DEQ each year. I actually just finished that process up this week. Um, so they get credit in the um, Bay model in um, reducing our pollution in the in our waterways. And I've got some more photos of BMPs coming up, so I'll I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so this is just a slide that kind of shows what kind of issues VCAP can help address. So how can VCAP help a residential property, for example? And you can kind of see some photos on the right of erosion, um, poor drainage, or poor vegetative cover. Those are the three um, categories of resource concerns we look at trying to help solve. Um, so you can see on the slide, we look to treat stormwater runoff, stabilize drainage areas, control water, um, revegetate areas, all of that good stuff. And these are all things that we look for in, um, we actually have a ranking spreadsheet that we look at for each project. I won't go into too many details, but um, it's one of the criteria that we, we must, um, that must be demonstrated for us to fund projects. And that's to ensure that we fund um, the highest water quality projects with the highest water quality benefit um, that we can get with, you know, a, a reasonable cost. Go to the next slide, please. So here is just a map of where our BMPs have been installed, and it doesn't do it justice at this scale um, because there are areas of the state down in um, Virginia Beach area, Northern Virginia, where there's more BMPs than you can see with these little dots. Um, but this is the number of BMPs from 2016 through this past June 30th, 2021. That's when our program year wrapped up. And this is about 730 to 40 projects that we have completed and reported. And it looks kind of like a population map. Um, we have a couple new projects that have just gone in outside the Chesapeake Bay watershed in Southwest Virginia. And that's what we hope to continue to really spread out our BMPs and spread the impact of um, the water quality benefits to, to do the, the greatest good for our waters. But there's a, a map of where we've installed projects. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. And these next three slides are just some photos of some quick completed BMPs. And um, this one's on a residential property backyard in Albemarle County with the Thomas Jefferson Soil Water Conservation District. And you can see the before and after photos are really dramatic. Um, there probably was a couple issues going on on site before the BMP was installed, um, probably upland neighbor runoff and just, you know, shade that was not allowing vegetation to grow. So they put in a conservation landscaping meadow and, um, you know, provides wonderful water quality benefits. And we require native plants to be used for all of our vegetative projects. So those native roots are doing a great job of um, keeping that soil there and not letting it run off. And then in addition to providing other, um, you know, pollinator, pollinator wildlife habitat. Next slide, please. Here's a more structural project. Um, this is a vegetated stormwater conveyance, um, probably better known as a dry swale. That's how we categorize it. This is also in a residential property in Chesterfield County with the James River Soil Water Conservation District. Uh, this is one of those houses that was at the bottom of the lot. Uh, multiple upland houses drained to it, so they um, worked really hard to find the, the best solution, and it was a dry swale to really slow infiltration and um, not, you know, avoid the upland erosion. They also tied in their downspouts to treat additional drainage, so this treats a whole lot of um, drainage area in this one small site, so really strong BMP. It's still relatively new, but it'll, it'll fill in a bit more, I'm sure. Um, next slide, please. This is the last example I have. Um, so the format I got a little messed up, my apologies. But this is a buyer attention in Henrico County um, with Henricopolis Soil Water Conservation District. And they installed a buyer attention basin. So you can see the before photo in the top left um, was quite bare. And they didn't have any downspouts prior to this project. So they installed those and treated almost the entire roof area, which is really wonderful. And we can see the excavation photos and all of the engineered soil layers that go into a project like this. And this project is also very new. Um, it's just about a year old. So this bottom right photo was taken a couple months ago and it is doing really wonderfully. And, oh, I was gonna mention that this might look familiar to folks who maybe have only seen rain gardens. So a buyer attention is essentially a, a larger version of a rain garden. Um, we typically get homeowners reaching out about interest in rain gardens and larger scale properties like this place of worship with interest in buyer attention, um, if that's what they're looking to install. Um, buyer attention is just for a larger drainage area than a rain garden. So that's kind of the difference that we, we get questions about that a lot, but a really strong BMP as well. Okay, last slide, or next slide. 
um, I'll wrap up quickly here um, with something that might be of interest to this group, um, the Chesapeake Assessment Scenario Tool, or CAST. Um, it is something that we've recently utilized to uh, model our data and get quantitative um, outputs about the impact of our projects so we can get the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment that's been reduced by our BMPs. This is a really, uh, it's new, a new tool to me, um, but I think it would pair really well with work you all do with water monitoring or just having it as a tool under your belt. Um, you also can just look at public water resource information. So I think it's a great place to, to consider looking into if you were looking for more data for the work you do. Um, next slide, sorry that I'm cutting close on time. This is kind of our output that I consolidated that gives us the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment that we've been able to reduce per year. Um, this is not updated yet through the most recent program year. That's on my to-do list for next. Um, but you can see the, the numbers compound. So we um, each year moving, moving forward, we've um, added the impacts from previous years because those BMPs are still on the ground and having those um, pollution reduction benefits. So um, sediment reductions have been really strong. Uh, not surprising, phosphorus numbers are um, not as large, but that's a given. Um, we're really excited to have this data. Um, again, through CAS, you're able to kind of model different scenarios and pull reports and relatively easy to, to get these numbers. So next slide. I just wanted to give some um, information about if you're interested in learning more about VCAP. Um, there's our website here. I think these will be sent out or this recording will be sent out. It's got photos, training resources, um, guidance documents, all of the information you need to know is on our website. If you have a water monitoring group that, you know, is looking to collaborate and partner to set up some kind of water quality improvement initiative in the area you work, I think this would be a great resource to start and see kind of what projects may be feasible for you to um, look into. I have one last slide with our contact information that I'll wrap up with. Um, these are our five staffers at the association. Again, we work really closely with your local soil water conservation district staff as well. Um, but if you have any questions about anything, you can certainly reach out to us. Um, email is probably the best way. And we'd love to either answer your questions or point in the right direction. So that's all I've got. Um, I see some questions in the chat that I can certainly answer. Um, but thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mario. Uh, I think a lot of folks have learned a, a lot about soil and water conservation districts. Uh, one of the many hats that I wear on this bald head of mine is I am a director for Henry Coppola Soil and Water. And uh, we have a little joke that goes around that uh, if uh, someone doesn't know about uh, what soil and water districts do, uh, they should ask their children because uh, we have a very active uh, education program in Henrico County. That's um, we do have some questions in chat, uh, but uh, if you had any questions, please add them to the chat feature and we will get through as many as we can until 1115. So if you want to just start with um, how somebody would apply, how a homeowner would apply for the VCAP program, and then maybe touch on the requirements um, for um, getting involved in VCAP and if you have to be voluntary or if you can comply with any of your stormwater control practices. Sure. Um, so if you have interest, either you're a homeowner or have a eligible property um, and you were looking to see if <clears throat> you're eligible for VCAP, um, you would reach out to your local soil water conservation district um, and they would be the first ones to come out to your property um, do a site visit with you and come and walk around your property um, and they'll be able to determine the best next steps um, they'll know the criteria they're looking for um, if the solution <coughs> excuse me is too large or too small for vcap um, it kind of needs to be um, the right fit for our project projects that we can fund um, but yeah, reach out to your local district and I can certainly put you in touch with those people if you ever wanted to reach out. Um, in terms of the voluntary um, nature of the, the program, um, it's not intended to be a regulatory program um, or meet any regulatory requirements. Um, so it needs to be um, just a voluntary um, application. And um, if you have any like stormwater requirements, it can't be need to meet those. But if you want to exceed requirements, um, we are more than helpful happy to um, fund projects for that, but um, hope that answers your questions. Great. And then we have one other question. Um, what's the best way to figure out which program is best for supporting a particular agricultural BMP, since there's a few different options out there? 
Yeah, that's not my area of expertise, but again, your local district would be able to help you with that. Um, there are a lot of different ag BMP options. Um, the Department of Conservation and Recreation also has a lot of information on their website. They'd probably be another great place to look. I think it is confusing with the number of programs that at least we offer, um, which one is the, the right one to pursue. And again, your local district should be able to, to help um, figure that out with you because um, it sometimes can be quite site specific. There isn't always a clear answer. Sounds good. And is there a place where people can access the map of VCAP uh, BMPs? Not at this time, um, but I, you can certainly reach out to me. Um, we don't have it publicly posted anywhere um, just because it, well, yeah, reach out and I can, um, I can help you out. I think I see, yeah, Zach in the, the chat. All right. Sounds good. It looks like we don't have any other questions. Thank you so much. And I'll turn it back to you, James. All right. Thanks, Liz. I feel like a news reporter. Uh, back to you, James. Um, anyways, uh, we have uh, one uh, presentation before we uh, have our lunch. Uh, our fourth speaker of the day is Aaron Belt uh, with the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. Aaron will be speaking about stormwater management and solar farms. Erin is the program manager for DEQ Office of Stormwater Management. She's been with DEQ since 2014. Previously, Erin held the roles of inspector and plan reviewer for the DEQ Stormwater Program. Prior to joining DEQ, Erin worked for two different localities in Southeast Virginia and the state of Georgia. These positions have focused on compliance with stormwater and erosion and sediment control programs. Erin graduated from the University of Georgia where she earned her undergraduate degrees in forestry and wildlife, as well as master's in wildlife management and ecology. Welcome, Erin. Thank you, James, and thanks everybody for having me today um, for this discussion. Um, like James said, I'm gonna focus on stormwater and erosion and sediment control for solar development projects. Um, solar is a fairly new development sector um, to the agency um, and has expanded quite significantly since um, the Commonwealth joined the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in 2020, as well as um, the Virginia Clean Economy Act that was passed last year um, through legislation. Um, next slide, please. So on the agenda today, um, I'll do a high level review about what the permit by rule process is at Virginia uh, versus um, the very specialized piece of the PBR process um, specific to stormwater and erosion and sediment control. I'll talk a little bit about traditional plan review versus expedited plan review. Um, I will touch on uh, Senate Bill 1258 from the 2021 session um, that allows for uh, localities that operate as a VESCP authority, so an erosion and sediment control authority to coordinate solar plan review with the agency. Um, we'll get into some common issues that we're seeing in the field and how we're trying to address those um, consistently uh, with the solar development sector. Um, talk about the stormwater program goals versus what localities have um, in their tool chest that the agency um, doesn't necessarily have. And then we'll have some uh, question and answer session. Next slide, please. So in Virginia, um, we have a process called permit by rule. Um, and what that means generally is that there are a suite of provisions of multiple different regulations um, where a project has to comply. So it's managed by our renewable energy program out of the air division, and it covers more than just solar. It also covers uh, wind and other renewable energy um, uh, development sectors. Um, but very, very much um, right at this time, solar is the renewable energy um, development sector that is um, expanding rapidly. So uh, the link that I've provided there um, will actually take you to um, DEQ's website specific to uh, renewable energy and that process. Um, and one of the things that is uh, specific to DEQ um, with the permit by rule process is the megawattage that the agency can uh, regulate um, in that permit by rule process. So DEQ is only permitted to work with um, solar development um, between um, five megawatts up to 150 megawatts. So one of the things this is not going to cover is uh, solar on your rooftop as a single family homeowner. 
Um, and what it's not going to cover as well on the other side of the spectrum are the very large um, utility scale solar projects. We have a few of them in the state. There's one in Spotsylvania County. Um, anything over 150 megawatts of expected um, energy production and post construction. So after the project is complete, those projects go through the permit process through the State Corporation Commission. Um, that does not mean that the State Corporation Commission reviews the stormwater or erosion and sediment control. It just means that they manage that permit by rule process for those extra large projects. Next slide. So the, again, the PBR requirements, they are, um, they are varied. Um, the list, there's a documentation um, list that the um, renewable energy staff um, produce uh, for folks to make it easy on them as they're submitting. Um, part of the notice of intent that's required for the PBR process includes certifications from the locality about land use ordinances. Um, it also includes interconnection studies to connect to the PJM power grid along the mid-Atlantic, um, and it also includes an analysis of the beneficial and adverse impacts on natural resources. Those are just a few of the items I wanted to highlight in the course of the discussion today. Next slide. So fast forwarding to stormwater and ENS. This is only one of the many things that the PBR process requires the applicant to undertake. And so where DEQ is the VSMP authority, Stormwater Management Plan Review for Solar Development is coordinated out of DEQ Central Office. Uh, prior to January of this year, um, there were one and a half people doing this role, uh, my senior plan reviewer, Heather McAllister, and also myself. So um, the, uh, the legislative changes um, that have allowed for um, expedited plan review, as well as erosion and sediment control coordination with DEQ for those ENS only authorities. We have been able to hire um, three staff in January that are still in training and learning um, their role with solar plan review, but we are actually expecting to uh, bring on two more people this fall. That's just how big this development sector is and um, how, how much work it is to undertake these projects. So for projects that are proposing to disturb 100 acres or greater, um, the General Assembly in 2018 um, added a budget amendment that allows the applicant to pay a voluntary $30,000 um, plan review fee that uh, also covers that $9,600 um, for 100 acres or greater of disturbance. That $9,600 lives in our um, fee schedule for permitting. Um, but the cost above and beyond that allows them to receive an expedited plan review. It only allows for stormwater expedited plan review. It does not encumber the local BESCP authority to provide review on a more expedited um, timeline unless the local authority has that um, as an option through their either uh, special use or conditional use permitting um, or a local ordinance. So all non-expedited plans are subject to the traditional plan review timeframes that are set in the VSMP regulations. Next slide, please. So again, just, just to provide you the actual language of that budget amendment, um, it has changed a little bit over time. Uh, at first in 2018, it said that the agency may allow um, or may is authorized to allow for voluntary expedited plan review. Um, I believe in 2020, it changed to any VS, basically any VSMP authority. So if you or your locality operates um, a stormwater authority as an extension of DEQ's program, you are authorized to charge this for expedited fees if you would like to. Um, if you already have an expedited fee that is defined by your locality, there is no obligation to incorporate this language into the um, uh, the local suite of um, fee, fee scales or expedited plan review process. Um, and one of the benefits of this is that um, this uh, language in the budget bill has generated some uh, fees to allow us to hire additional staff. But the downfall of this is that uh, the 45 days that's captured in this uh, plan review um, it also includes weekends and state holidays. So one of the things that I have learned through this process 
is that where our base regulation and permit regulation language um, speaks to business days, if you're looking at something in a legislative um, uh, body of uh, work, those days are calendar days. So we have, um, we have solar developers that like to give us plans on a Thursday so that the next day the plan review starts and then we immediately lose Saturday and Sunday um, because we're only authorized to work so many hours per week. And I would never ask my staff <laughs> to work on a Saturday or Sunday to get a plan review completed. Next slide, please. So again, where uh, DEQ is the BSMP authority, um, a lot of times we see that local BESCPs, those ENS authorities, um, either provide review in-house, but most likely are using third-party entities. Um, we do require written notification of ENS plan approval prior to issuing our plan approval letter. Um, but after that plan approval letter is issued, um, my permitting staff will then issue a permit coverage letter. So there will be two letters available um, in the SWIP in that stormwater pollution prevention plan on site. They'll have the permit um, coverage letter and that plan approval letter. Um, but land disturbance may not commence until after both the ENS and stormwater permits are obtained. Next slide. All right. So Senate Bill 1258, um, the letters that went out to localities um, about this change in legislation were sent out this past week. Um, some of you may have received those or heard about those in your locality, um, but only localities that operate an erosion and sediment control program only have the option to coordinate solar plan review with DEQ. Um, in addition to allowing for um, ENS authorities to coordinate that plan review uh, with DEQ, it also requires the agency, agency to set a fee schedule for erosion and sediment control plan review. So at this time, we do not have a fee schedule specific to ENS. We only have one related to construction stormwater, um, including MS4 and our annual standard and specification entities. Um, and the fees that will be defined um, for erosion and sediment control plan review will be charged to the applicant, not the authority. So the authority can reach out to us, ask us to coordinate that review. That does not incur a charge to the locality. And uh, where that plan review may be coordinated, the locality will still um, be required to conduct their program administration, inspections, and enforcement under the statutory update. Next slide. Okay, so getting back to stormwater, one of the things that I wanted to focus on today is what stormwater does and what stormwater doesn't. So in the statutory language, um, it very specifically calls out that stormwater authorities will maintain the after development runoff flow rate and characteristics that replicate as nearly as possible the existing pre-development runoff characteristics in site hydrology. And this is for all of our development sectors. So we, we receive a lot of complaints about, well, I shouldn't call them complaints. Some are complaints, some are concerns about solar development in the state. Um, we understand that it's upsetting to see when trees are cut down. We understand that there are families that have concerns over their agricultural land being leased to solar companies for 20 or 40 years for a project. But unfortunately, that's the part of the process that DEQ has no authority to be engaged in. If there's a complaint or concern related to volume of water or um, the inability to meet the uh, nutrient neutral assumptions of um, the part to be technical criteria, those are the areas that we can assist with and make sure that those plans and that development is compliant with the state regulations. But those planning processes, those conditional or special use uh, permitting processes that happen at the locality, um, all of those activities have already taken place by the time the applicant comes to us and said, we would like to build. So, you know, we don't, we don't have an opinion for or against solar. Our, our primary role is to mitigate the impacts of development. And this is what the statute requires us to do, is to mimic near, as nearly as practicable the pre-development runoff characteristics in site hydrology. Next slide, please. So some of the common issues that we are seeing in the field, um, but also with plan review, to start with, we have three water quality land cover classifications. 
So um, it's very rudimentary and um, there's uh, extremes on both sides with impervious cover and forest open space, which is very, very prescriptive. So forest open space cannot be disturbed during construction unless there is a defined restoration plan associated with that area. And then impervious cover covers or includes everything from gravel to rooftops, concrete pads, um, switchyard substations, that all may be part of an overall solar project. Um, at this time, the agency does not consider the area underneath a solar panel to be prescriptive as impervious. Um, we do consider the racking system poles and posts and any poured concrete that may be holding those structures in place as impervious. But underneath the panels and all other disturbed areas on the site that are not forced open space and are not impervious, we consider that to be managed turf for the for the purposes of defining what quality reduction is necessary for that project. So what we do during plan review is we focus on verifying what is what is existing on the ground. So those plans that are submitted to us, are they accurate? Is it an accurate depiction of what the current state is on the project? And then inspections, our compliance staff live in our regional offices, and those inspections focus on making sure that the permit conditions are met and are verifying that what's been approved in the plan is what's actually occurring on the ground. Next slide. So some of the issues that we're seeing in the field that we have been talking to the industry about for several years now are related to compaction and post-construction compliance. So we're finding that geotech reports are indicating that compaction should occur um, in more than just the areas that the roads are being proposed. So all solar projects, especially the mega solar utility scale solar projects are gonna have some kind of road system through the property, whether they are existing farm roads or newly created, those roads help them get to the areas of the site to conduct maintenance to check on the systems, to reach their stormwater management facilities for maintenance and inspections. Um, so we are, we are currently in the midst of discussions about what those geotech recommendations are in the plan versus what's being proposed on the project versus what's actually happening in the field. So if we've got compaction, um, we've potentially have a greater increase in volume. There's potentially more volume, more water quantity, leaving that site that needs to be attenuated in those stormwater management facilities and post-construction. So um, there, there are components of restoration after construction at decommission. Um, DEQ doesn't typically review a decommissioning plan at this time. Um, what we're seeing in most cases is that localities are requiring decommissioning plans to be submitted as part of that special use or conditional use permitting process. And in some cases, we know that localities are holding bonds on these facilities to make sure that um, if, if they either go bankrupt or um, if it becomes a non-functioning site or they want to leave the site early, that financial assurance is gonna make sure that decommission actually happens. So um, for the quality compliance on site, we're seeing large areas of forest open space being captured to offset the required total phosphorus reductions. So we record this area um, similar to a traditional BMP uh, best management practice. We have template agreements that have been uh, defined and coordinated with the AG's office. Um, and we require from a forest open space perspective for those areas to be set aside, um, for there to be no development or change in land cover for that forest open space for the length of the project. So if that solar project is going to be there for 20 years, we need that forest open space to also be present for the same amount of time because it's offsetting um, and providing a balance to the amount of uh, total phosphorus that's entering the stormwater management system. So, and then most of our sites are meeting quantity. So that volume of water that's coming off the site, we're, they're meeting quantity by having uh, water detention facilities only. So they're not quality facilities. They're not putting in bioretention facilities. They're not uh, creating um, uh, constructed wetlands. They're not getting any quality associated with those uh, facilities that are detention only. Um, and in some cases, they are able to meet sheet flow. Um, that's pretty rare that they're able to do that. 
Um, but in some cases where it's pretty flat down in the type water area, we have seen cheat flow as an option. Next slide. So again, I wanted to mention some of the abilities and, and toolbox um, items that localities have that DEQ does not. So we don't have planning ordinances. We don't have zoning and landscaping and noise ordinances. Um, we very much want localities to utilize the suite of tools that you have during those initial planning processes because once it gets to DEQ for that stormwater or that erosion and sediment control review, we can't help change what has already occurred at the locality. Um, in some cases, we're seeing proffers and negotiations like additional firehouses for EMS support, um, upgrades to road construction. Um, those negotiations can take place during that conditional use process, um, proper negotiations that may happen through zoning planning or through economic development. Um, but even more important to us is that um, when localities don't um, provide uh, forward-facing information and make it public that there are large-scale solar development projects being proposed, um, we get you know, calls from citizens saying, our locality didn't tell us or nothing was posted. So I don't always believe that that's the case um, because sometimes um, information is not readily available, but it doesn't mean it's not present. It doesn't mean that there wasn't a public hearing notified in the paper, but the citizen doesn't get the paper and it's not posted online. So we know that it's hard sometimes to get information out to citizens um, and that maybe misinformation um, through the uh, local network of um, community activities uh, shares things that aren't necessarily what's occurring. So when the, when the local boards, when the local council meetings, having public information sessions with your um, um, council members, all of those types of activities really help to make um, the citizens in your community aware of what's happening and answer their questions. Because when DEQ gets complaints about the planning process, we have to send them back to the locality anyway. Um, and it looks like we're passing the buck when really we're trying to get folks in touch with the applicable folks that can answer their questions. Next slide. So some of the uh, planning strategies that we've seen localities use um, that again, go back to those suite of tools that localities have, things that they can request um, during those initial planning processes at the locality um, landscaping buffers, um, even if you don't have a landscaping ordinance, you can still ask for those. We have some localities that are asking for wetland buffers as a protective measure. We see those on the plan sheets when we get them. We've asked developers, why is there a 50 foot buffer on this wetland? That's not a component of our wetland program. And they tell us the locality asks us to do that. So we're seeing some of the things that localities have asked for present on those plans. Um, one of the beneficial things that has um, exploded with uh, the development sector of solar is planting native grasses, but also planting pollinator species. Um, there's no additional benefit from a water quality perspective. So ground cover is ground cover is ground cover. Um, but what that does do is it's supporting um, the native flora and fauna in Virginia. So where we are losing rapidly our bee species, where we need to plant more um, uh, for all of our different um, uh, native grasses to make sure that they're not overtaken by exotics and invasives. There are localities that are adopting these requirements into their local ordinances, and we're seeing these, again, show up on plans. Um, one of the benefits of having panels that are tracking with the sun versus non-tracking is that by tracking, you're constantly changing how the rain is hitting the surface below the panels, um, those stationary panels, it's like having a house with a roof and no gutters. So as that rain falls off those panels that don't track, it's hitting the ground and causing compaction just from the energy and power of those raindrops hitting the ground. So in most cases, um, folks are choosing to use tracking panels or they've been asked to use tracking panels for that very reason. Um, Another option that I've talked to about recently with uh, Joe Lurch at Baco um, is comprehensive planning. So we have some localities that are utilizing their comprehensive planning process to um, locate solar in their community in very specific areas. So maybe only in the industrial development you know, zone that they have identified in their comprehensive plan. Um, or saying that you can't be 
within so many feet of a school or so many feet of a residential zoned area. Um, again, these go back to planning strategies and the tools that localities have. Um, and then from a DEQ perspective, we are seeing um, with our Brownsfield program um, an increase in interest on reclamation and reuse of these generally non-usable properties to, to place solar on them because not much else can be done with them. Next slide. And so this is my last slide. I uh, just wanted to give you my contact information, provide a couple websites, including the BMP Clearinghouse, which has all of our proprietary and non-proprietary BMPs and links to some really beneficial information. Um, any of our um, notices of intended regulatory action, guidance updates, periodic review, all of that you can find on Virginia Town Hall. And then also um, recommending that folks use the legislative information system. If you're not familiar with it, that's where all of our Virginia administrative code, as well as the code of Virginia lives. Um, so the most updated version at any time is going to be available on the LIS. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, very interesting material, a lot, lot to cover. Um, so I think uh, we do have some questions here, uh, Liz. Yeah, if you could um, kind of go over the terms, uh, the land cover, um, that classification for these sites. So do, are the panels themselves considered impervious area or if there's managed turf below the panels, is this um, accounted for as pervious? Okay, that's a great question. So the only area under the panels that DEQs to be con uh, DEQ considers to be impervious are the poles um, that's called the racking system. Um, the poles that enter into the ground, uh, we look at a surface area associated with each one of them. There may be 12,000 poles on a project and they multiply that area to get the impervious cover over the entire site. But other than the pole area that enters the ground, or if they also include concrete for stability, um, we consider the area outside of the pole, but under the panel to be managed turf. Um, generally, anything that's disturbed on a project, if they're going to be grading, um, uh, blading, uh, removing trees and pulling the stumps out of the ground, that is, that is the widest category of water quality land cover is managed turf. Um, when you're looking at water quantity, there's a whole array of curve numbers which indicate the ability for water to either infiltrate or run off the land surface. That's a much larger category that you select from. It's not as prescriptive as forest open space, managed turf, and then impervious. So those three land cover categories are specific to defining the total phosphorus reduction from a water quality perspective, not the water quantity perspective. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, could you tell us a little bit more, how similar are the, lo the locality's ordinances um, on installation of these solar panels? Are they pretty similar from locality to locality or do they wide have a wide range of different um, needs? Okay, that's a great question. So we are seeing localities that um, are not using any of their tools um, and then realizing belatedly that maybe they should have taken an extra look um, at the development as it was coming into the county. Um, those are typically localities that have um, been impacted by solar um, late in the game, um, where solar is just starting to enter those localities and maybe they have one person that wears five separate hats. You know, the person that's the building official is also the community development director, is also the ENS inspector and the plan reviewer. Um, having worked for a locality like that previously, I, I can very much appreciate how difficult it is to manage um, very uh, savvy and well-funded um, the solar development community is. Um, and in many cases, they have come in and worked with the uh, uh, property owners prior to even reaching out to the locality um, to talk about the development. They're going in to make sure they can get those lease options or lease agreements um, in place before they reach out to the locality about the development. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have some localities that are so well versed in solar 
that they have created solar ordinances. They have required um, planting natives and pollinator species as a condition of their solar ordinance. Um, and they're requiring significant proper negotiations during that planning process because they want to make sure their locality is supported um, for what potential needs they have to provide to that solar development during the course of its life. Gotcha. And is um, DEQ or VACO or some other entity kind of helping to coordinate locality planning strategies so that they can learn from each other and maybe help some of those um, localities catch up? So um, the reason that I'm able to speak on some of these planning and zoning processes is because of my background. Um, you're not going to find a lot of people at DEQ that has this type of experience or background knowledge about what happens at the locality level. So unfortunately, where I feel very comfortable talking about it because I've lived it before, it's not a skill set that most of our agency staff have and can coordinate. Um, that being said, I have um, talked to Joe Lurch. We have started some initial discussions. Um, Joe works with VACO, the Virginia Association of Counties. And one of their goals has been to make sure that the localities being impacted by solar um, are well positioned to accept um, and integrate that type of development in their locality. Um, but again, uh, one of the things that I have the benefit of at the state level that I didn't have at the locality level is the pressure of local political will. So if the Board of Supervisors or the, you know, the council wants this development, there's not much that the folks in the regulatory seats in the locality can do to prevent it if, um, if the political will in the locality is ready to let them come in with no conditions. So having been in that position before, I, can, I recognize and appreciate how difficult that can be at times. But um, I typically have one-on-one -on -one conversations with localities. Um, I'm currently doing that, um, again, very, um, very frequently in the past week related to the letters that were sent out to localities that serve as ENS authorities only um, to ask them, do you want our assistance with plan review? If you do, how can we help you? So um, this is solar is um, is probably 75% of what we do in the central office location right now with plan review um, and outreach. Um, and we, we help as much as we, as we can. We just have not had anything organized um, from DEQ's perspective to work with localities specifically on what their needs are. Gotcha. And final question is that I assume that also means that there aren't any specific state requirements um, in regards to solar development either. It's all local, locality-based. So in terms of planning and zoning, yes, all of that will always be locality based. Um, DEQ does not have the authority to um, um, adopt or create additional requirements for industry that are not already in our statute. So for instance, if there was a push for native species and pollinator plants to be a requirement of solar, um, the legislative body would have to take action to pass that requirement and then an associated regulation would have to be written and promulgated by the State Water Control Board for us to require that. So that's why we very much encourage localities to use the tools that they have and be very knowledgeable and savvy about what they have at the locality level. Because once it comes to me and my staff, the only things that we can look at are what is um, the guardrails that we have with the stormwater and ENS regulations. Gotcha. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I think we're at time now. So James, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Liz. And thank you, Aaron, for um, giving your wonderful presentation today. Thanks, James. Uh, this concludes our morning presentations. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers uh, who have spoken uh, this morning. We're now going to take a one and a half hour uh, for lunch. Uh, we will regroup and start promptly at 1.15 this afternoon. Please return by that time to hear from our next four presenters. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, to the 2021 Virginia Water Monitoring Council Conference. Um, this morning, we heard from Brian Richter with uh, on the wise management of water use, Aaron Porter on water quality and urban streams, Maria Christensen uh, talked about the work of soil water conservation districts in the VCAP program, and Aaron Belt talked about stormwater management and solar farms. This afternoon, we'll hear from our last four presenters of the day, Upal Gosh is from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Mike Heislett 
from Virginia Vernal Pools LLC, Liz Chidova from the Alliance Chesapeake Bay, and Dana Henry with the, Virgin with the Peninsula Master Naturalist Water Quality Team. As we did this morning, we will take a 15 minute break after our second speaker. Also, I would like, uh, also as in this morning, we will be recording this session for the afternoon uh, uh, speakers. If you have a question or comment for the speaker, simply type your question in the chat feature. Liz Chudova will read as many questions as possible during the Q&A period and allow the presenter to respond. I would like to now introduce our first speaker this afternoon, Dr. Upal Ghosh, uh, will present on in situ PCB PAH remediation using sediment amendments. Dr. Ghosh is a professor department in the Department of Chemi Chemical, Biochemical, and Environmental Engineering at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. His group performs research on environmental engineering and science with a focus on the fate, effects, and remediation of toxic pollutants in the environment. His research has contributed to the development of transition of non novel sediment remediation technologies. Welcome, Dr. Ghosh. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I hope uh, we'll have an opportunity in the future to meet in person. And um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about our work. And as you can see from the title, we are making uh, uh, a bit of a transition from water quantity and water quality issues to uh, include toxic chemicals in the water. And specifically, I'll be talking about some of the work we have been doing, looking at uh, protecting these, the water quality and uh, what it supports from effects of toxic chemicals. So in the title, we talk about PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, but the work that I will be talking about uh, covers a whole range of hydrophobic chemicals that are toxic and bioaccumulative. And these would also include some of the chlorinated pesticides, for example, dioxins um, and uh, uh, many other uh, hydrophobic chemicals like that. So the focus here is on um, remediating contaminated sediments. But before we get into contaminated sediments, it's important to keep the full perspective of these toxic pollutants and how they transport and impact organisms in a water body. It's important to keep that in mind. So a lot of these chemicals like polychlorinated biphenyls, they were released in the past, they were banned in the 70s, but still continue to impact us. And the reason for that is these chemicals tend to persist for a long period of time. So another important and nasty characteristics of these chemicals is that they are persistent. They don't flow out into the ocean but stay embedded in the sediment deposits because these, these chemicals are hydrophobic. They don't like to be in the water phase. They bind to particles and settle out. So in the many of these cases, we have contaminated sediments under a water body. And we have many cases in our area here. I do a lot of work in Maryland, um, in Virginia. So I'll give you a few examples of our work in Virginia as well. And nationally, it just plays out in a big way to impact water quality. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the, the water quality impact that I'm talking about are uh, related to bioaccumulation of these chemicals in, uh, in the aquatic organisms, like the fish you, you saw in the, in the previous uh, picture. And what it does is it not only impacts the living organisms and uh, the uh, fish eating animals and birds, but also humans that uh, um, would go and catch the fish and try to consume it. So nationally, we have lots of fish consumption advisories, many in our uh, states here in Virginia and Maryland, that advise people not to eat the fish or limit the consumption of the fish that are caught locally. 
So the, the, the challenge for us is to figure out where these pollutants are coming from, how they're getting into the fish and how we can protect the great natural resource we have. The problem is that these sites are large that are contaminated from past activities. And these chemicals have uh, the tendency to, as I said, to, to bind to suspended particles. And so the legacy of those deposition over many decades when they were released in the past, uh, primarily in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, they, they got deposited in areas where sediments deposit. And oftentimes those end up being wetlands, beautiful wetlands like this one in the picture. This is actually um, from uh, Fort Eustis, uh, Virginia, where we did a pilot study several years ago. And this is, I believe, Bailey Creek is the name of the creek. And uh, it flows out into the James River, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. And it's a beautiful functioning wetland. And we have um, uh, brute force techniques that we can use to remediate that wetland, for example, which is contaminated with PCBs in this case. We can dig out that wetland with the contaminated sediments and put it in a landfill so that the contaminants go away. But in the process of doing that, we would extensively damage that existing ecosystem. So if we want to step back and we want to think about what we are really trying to do here, which is reduce the exposure of these chemicals to the aquatic organisms, we're really trying to reduce that exposure and risk associated with these chemicals. We don't necessarily want to take those sediments out. So how do you clean up these ecologically sensitive sites without destroying it? And that was kind of a big motivation that got us started in here. To answer that question, we had to dig a little deeper and um, think about where the chemicals are and what happens when we try to use these traditional approaches of managing contaminated sediment deposits in water bodies. So next slide, please. So, so this is a picture, There's a, this is a busy slide. Let me get, get you, take you through this. Um, the, the one on the top, so both of these, uh, actually the one on the top comes from a National Research Council study that was done a few years ago, looking at effectiveness of dredging to remove contaminated sediments and the impact on water quality for 20 mega sites that were cleaned up. So these mega sites are um, large sites that took more than $50 million to clean up. And what they found was that 50% of those sites that underwent the cleanup with removing the sediments didn't achieve the goals. And that was kind of uh, uh, sad after all that expense that uh, wasn't quite effective in achieving the risk reduction goal. And at the, at the bottom of that story is the fact that when we try to remove sediments, we create a lot of disruption. So the picture on the top shows PCB concentrations in the water as a function of a dredging activity that happened over a period of time in one of the rivers in New York. And uh, at the bottom left corner of that graph, you see the characteristic baseline concentrations, which are really low. As you start removing sediments from that water body, those levels of PCBs go up because we are starting up old deposits of sediments with PCBs. And once the dredging stops, it comes with those water column concentrations fall back to the baseline levels. And that's been a problem. And uh, with using traditional technologies to take care of contaminated sediments. And the reason is uh, the figure in the bottom shows profiles of these uh, legacy contaminants, in this case, PCBs in Lake Hartwell. And if you look at the depth profile, so what, what, on the y-axis, you have different depths in the sediment. The highest concentrations are associated with the time period when polychlorine biphenyls were released at large numbers uh, in large quantities back in the 60s or so. And then it has been continually coming down. As we dredge and we remove, we expose some of the more contaminated stuff, which then increases the level of contamination that we have in the water column, at least temporarily. So that's been a big challenge. So a lot of our work um, went into understanding how these chemicals behave in these um, 
uh, water bodies where you have contaminated sediments deposited. Next slide, please. So at the, uh, at the core of this is an understanding of how chemicals go from the sediments into the water column and into the fish and its adsorption of these chemicals into the geochemistry or geochemical components in the sediments that controls that exposure. Some types of sediments tend to bind these pollutants very strongly. So these chemicals are not available for uptake into the fish. And in some, they are not bound that strongly and they are more bioavailable for uptake in the food web. And so for early work looked into understanding the difference across sites that we were observing in, in nature, where some sites were holding on to the past legacy more strongly than others. Next slide, please. So at the core of this, uh, again, the issue of sorption processes controlling bioaccumulation was a carbon story. So we, we, we all uh, hear about carbon in negative light when it's in the atmosphere in the CO2 form, but carbon plays a major role in life processes. And so when we look closely into sediments and geochemical components in sediments, we find a lot of carbon. And there is an interesting link here between the carbon in sediments and these toxic pollutants because these toxic pollutants being hydrophobic, they tend to like hydrophobic surfaces. And these carbon containing materials in sediments offer hydrophobic surfaces. And there is a whole range of these carbon containing geochemical components in sediments starting from woody debris, um, breakdown of plant and animal matter which is the decaying life forms. And they, have, uh, they, they are hydrophobic and they tend to absorb these hydrophobic chemicals. But in addition to that, we also find another type of carbon which ends up having a very unique um, relationship with these hydrophobic chemicals. We call them black carbon. So they range from coal, charcoal, um, some charcoal coming from human activities, some char, coming from forest fires. Then we also have soot coming from burning or partial burning of woody and other vegetative material. And when you look closely under a microscope, we find that you have this whole range of um, organic materials in sediments. When you look at how strongly these chemicals, hydrophobic chemicals bind to these different components, we find that the black carbon component, the charcoal, the coke and the coal have nearly two, three orders of magnitude stronger sorption for these chemicals than natural organic materials. So we've, in this early work, we, we, we finally found the reason why some sites tend to bind these chemicals strongly. And we found that those sites tend to have more of this black carbon. So if you can go to the next slide, so we start off with uh, natural organic matter where carbon is bonded to hydrogen and oxygen. And that's what we are made of. That's what plants are made of. That's what decaying vegetation is made of. And that has some sorption capacity for these hydrophobic chemicals. But when that material goes through a high temperature process, like in a forest fire or in a Coke oven um, or in my backyard barbecue, I produce this black carbon, which is a graphitic form of carbon it changes the structure of the surface, making it a lot more softive. On this, uh, and, and these hydrophobic chemicals then bind to the surfaces of these black carbon materials. Industrially, we can take that char, which can be either the biochar, which would be uh, like uh, charcoal coming from different organic, uh, different woody materials, to coke that comes from coal. Now coal is also woody material, just uh, diagenetically altered over millions of years. We, we end up the, with this material, which has a graphitic surface, which absorbs these chemicals. Industrially, we take these materials and we can activate it, which is increase that surface area through a steam activation process and make activated carbon. And many of you are familiar with activated carbon and the use in water treatment because it has the super high surface area which absorbs these top toxic chemicals and uh, allows us to clean air, clean water where we need to. So I wanted to give this uh, 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 
the transition going from biomass to biochar to activated carbon because there is a big carbon story in what I'm going to talk about next. So what we found is that naturally in these segments where we have this black carbon present, these toxic chemicals are bound up very strongly. So we published uh, several papers in that series looking at that natural abundance in some sites where um, bioavailability of the toxic chemicals are altered naturally by the presence of these black carbon. We then took that a little further as, uh, uh, you know, as engineers, we want to solve a problem once we understand what the problem is. So a big part is understanding and defining the problem. Once we define the problem, we can try to find solutions. So if we go to the next slide, so what we did was, so the early work we did involved taking contaminated sediments, con sediments contaminated with PCBs, polychlorine biphenyls or PAHs or DDT, even methyl mercury, and look at how organisms, aquatic organisms take up those chemicals. Um, and what can we do in terms of altering that geochemistry by bringing in more black carbon because in these some of these natural environments where we saw less bio uptake happening, we saw the role of black carbon in those segments. Now the question is, can we can we add black carbon to these segments, either biochar or activated carbon, which is tailored to have strong sorption capacity for these chemicals, to basically outcompete the organisms in these segments uh, for these toxic chemicals. So some of the early work looked at beaker and aquaria experiments where we would put a layer of this black carbon material on the surface of the sediments and allow um, freshwater uh, or saltwater organisms to inhabit those sediments and do the mixing on their own and take that carbon down into their burrows, as you can see in the top second picture, and then take those organisms out and measure those uh, chemicals, in this case PCBs, in the tissue of these organisms. Um, the figure on the bottom right is actually sediments that came from Bailey Creek uh, Fort Eustis, where we grew this amphipod, Leptochirus plumulosus, and that's an organism that lives in uh, brackish waters in sediments and is at the base of the food web, uh, aquatic food web. And it's a good indicator species in terms of what accumulation is happening in, um, uh, in these contaminated segments. So the red bars are, so the, 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 the figure there shows PCBs in the organism tissue. The red bars represent the concentration that is uptaken in the tissue uh, by these organisms um, um, for the different PCB homologs. So homologs are the different chlorination levels of the PCBs. As you know, polychlorinated biphenyls are 209 different compounds, depending on where and how many chlorines you have on the molecule. So for example, if you look at the tallest bar there, that's a hexachlorobiphenyl. So that PCB has, is a, that's the sum of all the molecules that have six chlorines on the PCB molecule. So the red bar is uh, the untreated sediment, the controlled sediment, and the organism picks up a lot of those PCBs. But if we add 5% by weight of activated carbon into those sediments and then have the organisms grow in that, we get a big reduction in the uptake in the organisms. And basically what is happening is that the PCBs are getting bound in that carbon so tightly that the organisms are finding it difficult to take it up, even though they are ingesting those sediments, even though they are exposed to the pore water that's at equilibrium with those sediments. So we get about so this is for the second generation. So these organisms grew and uh, produced new ones and the new ones uh, uh, after 60 day exposure, they are uh, showing 82% re reduced uh, uptake. So that's great that if the base of the food web can be manipulated with the geochemical manipulation we did in these beakers, that these organisms take up 82% less, that can be a way of um, interrupting that pathway of exposure to the organisms without actually destroying the ecosystem. So that was that was really uh, exciting. And we published a bunch of papers based on that. Um, and uh, we went on to uh, move, we moved from these benthic organisms at the base of the food web to, well, next slide please, um, to um, uh, 
the species that we may be more interested in the fish. And this was a study uh, supported by the National Institutes of uh, Environmental Health Sciences, the Superfund Research Program, where we looked at the next level in the food web in the fish. And we saw similar reductions. In this case, um, concentrations in the fish were reduced by 87%. So that was great. It's not only happening at the base of the food web, but also impacting uh, the uh, pelagic fish. And you know these fish are ingesting some of these worms. So they are also breathing the water. And overall exposure is coming down in the fish as well, which is great. Now we can do that in um, these aquaria settings in the lab. Next slide, please. Um, and and we and many others um, in, in the in the scientific community replicated these measurements for a whole range of uh, contaminants: PCBs, PAHs, DDT, dioxins. And the results were kind of similar across many labs, many experiments, many different sediments, and different um, chemicals. And you can see here uh, reductions in biooptake in the range of 70, going up closer to 95% reduction for many organisms. And that was really great. These are results from the lab studies. But can we take this out into the field? How is it going to work in the field? You know, I can do it in a beaker, but do I have a way to um, engineer that in the field? Next slide, please. So, um, uh, Conceptually, the way this might work is that we, we may be able to amend the surface of contaminated sediments with a carbon amendment that, is, uh, that has a very strong sorption capacity for the chemicals that we are targeting. And that would create a layer on the top surface of the sediments, which basically what it does is interrupts that pathway of exposure into the fish. So direct exposure from ingestion of sediments and the sediment living organisms by the fish, which is the left arrow in the bottom there. And also the other pathway of exposure that happens for fish in the water column is through diffusive exchange of the PCBs from the contaminant sediments into the water, uptake into the phytoplankton and the pelagic food web. And we can interrupt both of them by bringing in this additional material that enhances the uh, geochemistry in the right direction, which is making the sediments more adsorptive for those chemicals, so less goes up into the food web. So the question is, how do we engineer this in the field, right? So, um, so we worked with uh, several engineers and consultants and people who do sediment remediation to come up with ideas. So next slide, please. There are basically two approaches of doing this. We can add the carbon only to the top surface of the sediments and the organisms mix it up. And we create a bioactive zone, which has been altered in its geochemistry to make it more adsorptive for those chemicals. The other, in sites where the sediments are less stable, you can blend it with uh, sand or gravel to create a barrier layer that creates a new habitat, which is protected from the contaminated sediments below. So those are the two constructs that we can take out into the field. We, are, we had the opportunity to try this out. So next slide, please. We um, worked with uh, several agencies and, and um, uh, people who were trying to find solutions for contaminated sediments without um, having to dredge those sediments. And we did this across the country and also with several collaborators in Europe and tested it out in pilot scale first. And a lot of these studies basically um, um, told us the same story, that if you can get the carbon into the sediments in the bioactive zone, maybe top four to six inches, it reduces the bioptic of these pollutants in the food web, reduces the transfer of these pollutants into the water column reduces the concentrations in the water column by uh, enhancing the way it's bound up in the sediments. Next slide, please. So we got some recognition of that work. I published a, a feature article that came out uh, with a cover page uh, uh, picture of our early work in San Francisco Bay, where we did in a tidal mud we, we did a uh, pilot study in a tidal mud flat in um, uh, uh, Hunters Point Naval Shipyard, which was funded by the DOD. And then US EPA came up with a, a, a directive on 
looking at in situ amendments as a way to remediate contaminated sites. And this was, this came out uh, several years ago. So there has been some acceptance, I would say, in terms of recognizing that this is a viable approach for contaminated areas and sediments, which is impacting water quality. Let me give you a couple of examples uh, before I end. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So one of the first things we did was uh, try out in a river. This was funded by EPA and Alcoa in Grass River, New York. And we brought in the heavy equipment to mix the carbon into the sediments. And it worked, uh, reduced uh, bioaccumulation by 80 to 90% in the benthic organisms. But this was a lot of um, um, sediment um, manipulation in situ and uh, associated with it was a heavy cost of uh, mobilization. So we had to come up with a different approach to get the carbon into the zone that we are targeting. So next slide, please. So we are fortunate to get some support from EPA through a small business innovative research project, which was then supplemented with additional funding from National Institutes of Health to come up with a novel approach of delivery, delivery of these amendments, which, is, which has low impact. So one of the problems with carbon is that it, it's very light and it would float in the water. So we, we, we did some material engineering to make these pellets, which are basically carbon clay and sand made into these little briquettes that can be applied from the water column. And then it goes, sinks into the bottom of the sediment and slowly over time breaks up, releasing the carbon and the natural biological activity in the, by the sediment benthic organisms um, mixes that carbon into the sediment. So one of the first trials we did was at uh, Fort Eustis in the Bailey Creek. And that's the picture you see of me doing that application in small area from a boat um, in the wetland. Next slide, please. The other one is uh, work we did in a little bigger area. And this is a five acre lake in Dover. And this work was supported by uh, um, the Delaware Department of Natural Resources. If you click on that, I think there should be a video that uh, here the same materials are being applied by using a tele belt. And uh, so you have to scale up, work with engineers to figure out ways to do that amendment. And as you can see in the top right picture, the carbon after uh, a few months shows up in the top four inches of the sediment. And that's kind of where we were targeting. The idea is that it traps the contaminants in the sediments and less comes up into the water column and should impact the fish. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so the, here are the results from that five acre lake study in, so that's kind of a big aquarium for us. And we studied uh, the reductions in the concentrations of PCB in the pore water and in the surface water of that lake. It's part of a tidal um, St. Jones River there, I believe. And so it's a tidal system. So there are some migratory species that are going back and forth in the lake, but there are also um, uh, the resident fish. And we saw about 70% reduction in the resident fish in the lake. So that gives gave us the confidence that this is working out in a lake system and that those concentrations in the fish are coming down. So let's skip uh, the next slide and go to the one after that. I'm running out of time, I realize here. So there are a few full scale applications that are coming up. One in Virginia that uh, some of you may have heard of. This is in uh, Paradise Creek. It's part of Elizabeth River. And where the idea is to do partial dredging, capping, and also in situ treatment with activated carbon that should be coming online uh, late at the end of, by the end of this year. And then on the right is a scandal reservoir that EPA just, and this is dioxin contaminated sediments and 14 acres are going to be treated with carbon amendment into sediments. Let's go to the next slide. So since I'm out of time, I'm going to uh, skip the concluding thoughts. Um, it's kind of a summary of what I just talked about that um, uh, it's th this kind of an approach is applicable in depositional areas when and uh, where the contaminant bioavailability is high and ongoing inputs have been controlled. It's important to control ongoing inputs first. Um, let's go to the next slide and I'll conclude there. Uh, with acknowledgements, uh, this, all this work would not have been possible without uh, the tremendous amount of hard work that 
uh, oh, a very large number of graduate students, undergraduate students and postdocs did over the years. And the funding sources uh, and collaboration with multiple people. And I have a disclosure statement in the bottom that's uh, important. And that is, um, I have, I'm also, I also start, I have, um, I'm a partner in two startup companies that are uh, transitioning these technologies out um, into a, um, full scale and commercial enterprises. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. It's a very fascinating topic. I remember you giving that presentation when I was at DEQ and uh, I found it fascinating then and I still find it fascinating. Um, I think we do have maybe a time for maybe one question and um, we may have to alter our agenda a little bit. We're having a little bit of difficulty with our next speaker getting online, I believe. So Liz, a uh, question? Yes. Uh, we have one question. Have you investigated the impacts of the black carbon on other ecologically important compounds? In other words, could it limit essential nutrients or minerals? So well, that's a very good question, and that's always in the back of our mind. So we have we have done several studies, and others have done as well. And you know what I will do is uh, there is a review article that uh, that came out a few years ago. Uh, which summarizes all of that. So the basic, um, uh, in the, the nutshell, what people find is that when you do these studies, some of these studies in the lab, you might see some effects, but when we do them in the field where there is a nutrient supply that is happening and um, there, it's an open system, uh, people, people don't see any negative impacts as long as the carbon dose is below 5%. So if you go to higher doses of carbon, which often we don't need, then you start changing the matrix so significantly, it's not sediments anymore. You are starting, it's starting to look carbon. And then many organisms may not find it habitable uh, from the physical texture of the material or because nutrients are getting absorbed and some micronutrients are not being available as well. So those, effects start manifesting after we increase the dose beyond something like four or five percent. Great. Um, we'll do one more question while we're waiting for Mike to try to get on. Um, how would the coke be treated as it is taken from the coal plant to a contaminated water body? Um, could you could you repeat that again? The How's the coal? The, uh, how would the coke, C-O-K-E, be treated as it's taken from the coal plant to the contaminated water body? Yeah, so, so the activated carbon that you, we use can come from coal as the raw material, or it can also come from biomass. So there are, in, if we if we look at the large um, uh, availability of activated carbon in the industry, a big part of it comes from nut shells, coconut shells, and other hard nut shells, and and those are actually used a lot for water treatment because they have some really good properties and doesn't have any of the legacy contaminants, heavy metals that you might see in coal. But if it is used, if if the carbon comes from coal, which is um, done in many many of these sites, one has to be very careful about the source of the coal and make sure that don't have heavy metals in the material that's being added. And there are ways to get that get uh, any heavy metals if they are present in coal out of it. And 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 um, but that's that's absolutely important to make sure you're not creating a problem. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ghosh, for your presentation. I believe we have our next presenter uh, ready. We're just having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties. Uh, so I believe um, our next speaker, uh, Mike Hazlett, is on the phone. Um, and he is here to talk about vernal pools. Uh, Mike is the principal consultant for Virginia Vernal Pools, LLC. In his role, Mike consults for and educates organizes and uh, 
organizations and private landowners regarding vernal pool management and ecology. Mike has studied vernal pools since his childhood in Virginia Western Highlands. He has written many articles on the subject and traveled all over Virginia educating others about vernal pools. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much for the invitation. Always delighted to talk about my favorite subject. So hold on to your hats. I'm going to give you the fastest, most succinct talk on vernal pool ecology and conservation in the history of the universe. Next slide, please. I would like to dedicate the talk today to the memory of my father. This is uh, the third, excuse me, the tenth anniversary of his passing, and uh, spent many wonderful days afield with my dad, exploring vernal pools and other wilds here in the Allegheny Highlands. So I appreciate um, that indulgence. Next, so vernal pools to some folks is a brand new topic. I have spent um, well <laughs> my entire career and most of my all of my adult life pursuing these types of habitats. Uh, I have studied, I have advocated for their conservation, I have built some, I have restored others, trained many people, uh, and consulted in this arena as I continue to do today, and um, and and gained a great deal of satisfaction out of the pursuit of, of the pursuit of conserving these unique habitats. Next, I'll start here with a little, a little snicker and a grin. This is my first selfie uh, on a project in Northern Virginia almost a decade ago, and that is a constructed vernal pool, what I like to call a facsimile. Um, and go to the next slide, please. And uh, here is that same site when I visited this Spring, almost a decade after the construction of that uh, that vernal pool facsimile, and uh, I show you this just to to insert why vernal pools are appropriate to the overall topic of the conference today of water monitoring. Monitoring is the means by which those of us on the on the periphery who have come to know these little wetland systems intimately monitoring. Using basic observational science is how we have come to understand the ecological importance of these systems, how they function. Monitoring is also how, uh, in this case, in trying to create or restore, monitoring is obviously how we determine whether uh, our efforts are working, if they're being effective. So monitoring a created wetland is the way we determine if it is meeting the objectives that were set forth. And monitoring is particularly important now in the face of climate change to understand what the future of these habitats may be. Next. So uh, again, wetlands generally are, uh, are endearing habitats to those of us who are natural history or conservation types. Wetlands are, are fascinating environments biologically rich, a lot of fun to explore. And so again, over the years, uh, I have found them to be very interesting living laboratories and, um, and a great educational outlet for people interested in conservation biology. Next. So the slide before you, I trust, says a plethora of pools. Uh, one of the things that has driven me for many years is the, the variety by which these so-called vernal pools exist uh, in contexts across Virginia. They, they can vary from dunal swales along the Atlantic coast beaches to floodplain pools in the major river systems across Virginia, particularly in the Piedmont, and in the western mountains of Virginia, both the Blue Ridge and the Alleghenies, where I live in the Western Highlands, there are upland wetland sites that are fascinating. So this is a this is a, a, a wetland reference that we use, vernal pools, that spans a wide variety of, of wetland categories, and uh, they they reflect really the variety of environmental conditions across Virginia. But that's part of the fascination. Uh, no two are alike. Next. 
So let's try to just very uh, briefly define what a vernal pool is by using a sort of run-on adjective descriptor. <laughs> So uh, these, of course, are non-tidal or freshwater wetlands, interior wetlands, and they are generally isolated from other water sources, not typically connected to, to flowing water. They do tend to be forested, as, as our part of the world was historically mostly a forested landscape. Probably most crucial is they are seasonal. That is to say, the hydrology is such that these ponds or pools or wetlands hold seasonal water on the surface. And these images here show a site in central Virginia, both during the wet phase on the left and during its dry phase on the right. So this is quite the juxtaposition of, of an environment that is both aquatic for part of the year and then terrestrial for another part. I like to think of them as a double dose of biological diversity because of these contrasting environmental conditions. Next, uh, again, here's another image of this contrast. You can see this little pond, and this is on a ridge top, three blocks from my home, and this is where it all began for me. This was the vernal pool that I explored as a boy here in the Allegheny Highlands. And you can see the difference there. I was fascinated by this. Um, the, the, a site that could be a pond for part of the year and then during the summer would be this open glen and I could turn over those sandstone boulders and find ring neck snakes. So the contrast in these conditions just fascinated me from the very beginning. Next, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I have spent the last four years doing and that is a, a study of vernal pools and related wetlands um, and unrelated wetlands in my region here. So our national forests in, in the western highlands here encompass more than uh, a quarter million acres across parts of five counties in the Allegheny Highlands or Western Highlands region at the headwaters of the James River. And I've spent the last four years seeking out and inventorying many of these wetland resources as the dot map uh, shows. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll not labor this, but to say a project uh, for the US Forest Service, a special survey project, and I looked at all of the water features found on the national forest lands in my region, and, and these were divided into three basic categories. So naturally occurring seasonal ponds, or what we call vernal pools, vernal ponds, um, artificially created or constructed water holes, which are the opposite, and then a miscellaneous category that includes things like seats and, and springs, etc. So over the course of that work, more than 234 sites investigated, assessed, uh, geospatially uh, inventoried so that the agency could have this information to manage these habitat resources. And it's interesting to note that just a little under a quarter of all of these were, in fact, these natural vernal pools or vernal ponds. And that's a, a pretty significant uh, rate of occurrence over here in, in our mountainous region. Next. So let me show you some examples. Here is a vernal pool. This one's pretty big. This is about a, um, about a quarter acre. It's only 18 inches deep. And uh, this is in Bath County. This is a really nice quality vernal pool that, uh, that has a sort of um, semi-short cycle of, of ponded water on the surface. Next. And here's the contrast. This is a constructed uh, water hole. This was, was built, you can see in the background of this image, uh, the dam or the berm with a, an outflow pipe. And this is more than a half acre. It's exposed. It's quite deep. Uh, and it has the usual uh, sort of artificial pond uh, uh, flora and fauna. There's cattails and yellow flowering spatter dock. And these tended to be built in those days for game species benefit. So to attract ducks, uh, waterfowl for hunting. And they are often stocked with fish. Uh, and that, of course, is a major contrast 
between a, an artificial pond and a vernal pond. No fish in vernal ponds. Next. So the, the final category, the miscellaneous, the catch-all, <laughs> included mostly uh, natural but flowing wetland systems like springs and seeps. These would be littoral or flowing systems, not isolated wetlands like vernal pools. Next. All right, so if you're at the slide with the apples and the oranges, this was really in addition to providing the agency with the basic information to be able to manage the resources. This was a personal objective of mine, was to clearly communicate the differences between these artificial versus natural uh, wetlands in the defense of my beloved vernal pools. So you'll note the natural seasonal pond or vernal pond is seasonal because it doesn't have permanent water, it doesn't support fish. And fish are the primary uh, predator of some of the wildlife that specialize in vernal pool utilization. So the last item, the function, specialized species are able to use vernal pools uh, in addition to the general um, uh, fauna in particular that can utilize a vernal pool. Uh, I'll trust that you can get back to my presentation later. I do have links in here so you can uh, pursue further info. But next slide, please. Thank you, Matt. So the, the wildlife water hole, and there are three historic photos here on the desk. This is a relic, really, of the post-World War II days of cooperative wildlife management. Animals were stocked, uh, brought from distant places. We don't do that anymore. And these water holes were constructed. Uh, and they do, have, they do have general function in the landscape for wildlife, but they are not vernal pools. Next. So back to apples and oranges. Again, a vernal pool can accommodate the generalists, but it specifically can provide the need for specialized flora and fauna. So they're very often uncommon, rare, even threatened and endangered species that are found in these isolated wetlands, these insular populations that have been around for a long time. Look at the age here. Constructed water holes are less than a century old in those cases, but some of the vernal pools have been shown to date back to the last ice age. So that clearly means that in terms of management, these historic sites really should be afforded um, a, an absolute priority in managing them as natural area preserves. Where the other things um, you know, can be manipulated here and there according to the wildlife objective. Next slide. Here's another example, and, and this is at a particular area here in western Allegheny County that is really fascinating. It is a, uh, it's a karst or a limestone, limestone underlying uh, landscape. And let me tell you a little bit about it as I, as I further develop here. Uh, the ecology and conservation of vernal pools. So this site is up on the mountain. It is a terrace along the mountain created by limestone dissolving underneath and this collapsing and creating a depression along the slope of the mountain. And this site, when I, when I surveyed it, when I assessed it, it was so beautiful, verdant, and rich in vegetational growth during the growing season uh, that I kind of broke <laughs> from tradition and actually named it something a little cheeky <laughs> based on a cartoon. But this, this environment was so beautiful and exotic in its plant community that I, I called it, yes, Fern Gully Swamp. Next slide, please. Speaking of plants, these environments are very important places for native plants and particularly for highly specialized and even rare plant species. Uh, here are some of the more common things. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this slide should read bulrush pond, and this is one of the sinkhole ponds or karst wetlands in that Castile sinks area. And this particular pond is so named because 
it harbors the federally endangered plant, the northeastern bulrush. So there are often rare species, rare elements. Um, and I should remind you that these ecosystems, not just the rare elements of plants and animals, but the system itself or the community, these are regarded as globally rare natural communities by our state's natural heritage program. Next, please. All right, so your slide should show Castile Sinks. And this is sort of a picture of that whole neighborhood. And if you will note, there are one, two, three, four, five, there are at least five ponds. These are sinkhole ponds or vernal ponds. And in addition, there is a cluster of springs uh, that also occur here. So this is a rather complex area uh, because of the unique geology underlying it with, with, under, with underlying limestone where there are these fascinating wetlands, including vernal ponds. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here is a picture of all kinds of critters, and I am a critter guy. I am trained as a zoologist. So these are the animals that have been my uh, gateway studying the fauna of these sites. Now, these are all generalist species, and you could see anything here on this list in or around vernal pools in any given season. Next. But there are also, uh, there is also a suite of very specialized fauna. These are animals that we refer to as obligate species. They are indicators uh, of the unique wetland that we call a vernal pool. And these include, in Virginia, six species of the mole salamander family, several anurans, and then several species of, of a freshwater crustacean. Next, please. So this slide says spring fairy shrimp. Now these are small, freshwater, and, and rather bizarre in appearance, shrimp that exist in these vernal pools uh, in a single generation life cycle strategy. They're typically uh, winter. We also have a species in the summer. Next slide, please. But I would encourage you, <laughs> go to this link, this, this Vineo documentary when you have a chance. Uh, a friend of mine produced this. It's coming up on its 10-year anniversary. It's only 30 minutes. But it's a wonderful uh, overview of uh, vernal pools through the eye stalks of fairy shrimp. It's a great little watch. Please check that out. Next. In addition to the fascinating bi uh, biota, plants and animals, again, an emphasis on the fact that these are very historic, very old environments. This site is in the central Blue Ridge Mountains on a low ridge top. And in addition to it being a really cool vernal pool with, with four different obligate species of animals, it is a great archaeological site. The artifacts you see in the foreground there, right, bottom right, those are archaic uh, remains of Native Americans when they encamped around this seasonal pond some four or 5,000 years ago and manufactured stone tools while they were encamped there. I'm convinced that these ancient peoples were hunting ducks and deer routinely uh, at these environments in different seasons. Next slide, please. I'll tell you very quickly about Brown's Pond in Bath County. Now, this is a rather large sinkhole wetland in the upper elevations of the Allegheny Mountains here, and it is a particularly wonderful showcase of ancient history. Next slide, please. This image of Brown's Pond shows it during the growing season, and you can see cinnamon fern in the foreground and three-way sedge throughout it. Uh, in recent years, I've been collaborating with a research team of the U.S. Geological Survey 
and they have repeated um, soil core studies of this pond, and the pollen record there confirms that it is more than 17,000 years old. Our karst wetlands in the Allegheny uplands here were formed after the last ice age. So these really represent some of the oldest unchanged showcases of biological diversity that remain in our landscape today. Next slide, please. My apologies for the neighbor mowing their lawn. I hope that doesn't disturb our talk. So this slide shows um, a rare, a very rare ecosystem that we would think of as, a, as an oversized vernal pool. In the upper Shenandoah Valley, um, the sinkhole ponds there are renowned as being the showcases of, of, of relict um, and disjunct plant and animal species that have been there for a very long time. This, this area in particular is on the National Forest. There are some three dozen on, uh, on, on perhaps uh, 400 acres. And the suite of rare elements there is something like two dozen rare plants and nearly a dozen rare animals. The plants include Virginia sneezeweed, which is a nearly endemic plant to the sinkhole pond wetlands. Next slide, please. Now, very quickly, I would like to address conservation. Um, and of course, the most critical issue is that these wetlands, being forested wetlands, have a forest buffer that is retained to protect them. Many people are familiar with a stream management zone. I am forever preaching about a vernal pool management zone because preserving the critical upland habitat around these wetlands is really preserving the residential habitat of the living community, especially the amphibians which reproduce in these vernal ponds. So that, that buffering forest surrounding them is absolutely essential to the long-term sustainability of, of these wetlands. Next, please. And this is based on research that is tried and true. It's been around for 10 to 15 years now. Uh, there's plenty of citations uh, for these best practices. And, and in short, uh, if you look on the far right there, these area, these distances that determine the, the, uh, the standard are really based on research into the distances that the indicator or obligate amphibians would disperse away from the wetland. Next, please. Here are some more of the references so that you can dig into these resources. Uh, I routinely use them in my uh, attempts to uh, go to that for vernal pools. Uh, next. So I'm going to wrap up with uh, illustrating here uh, the importance of amphibians to the ecology and, and their conservation. Um, and I'm going to use one of my old pals, the Jefferson salamander, which is uh, rather common here in the Allegheny Mountains where I am at. And this is a species considered uh, to be of conservation need based on the Virginia Wildlife Action uh, Plan. So here's uh, Jefferson tepals or larvae on the left and a newly emerged salamander on the right. Next slide. Now back to this cool area. Uh, it, the, this Castile Sinks area. Here are two of the ponds, and these ponds both were identified as having Jefferson salamander populations supported reproductively by those ponds. And then the range or the, the buffer circle in red around each shows the extent to which that particular population of Jefferson salamanders would disperse out from the breeding pond. And this being a complex of wetlands, they overlap. And you realize, oh, here is a polygon, a complex area of the landscape, uh, wherein we would need to consider preserving the surrounding forest, the buffering forest. 
And this is particularly pertinent because this is the national forest where timber production is also uh, a priority for that agency. In truth, the management recommendation here for this site was keep it all. <laughs> this area is so unique, such a large complex, it ensure that the entire area around all of these wetlands um, is preserved to buffer it. Next. Now, very quickly, uh, let me explain why amphibians are so important. We use a technique of estimating relative population sizes around these wetlands to sort of uh, categorize their priority for, for conservation concerns using egg mass counts. So here's my buddy, Hubert, and he's helping me count, visually count the egg masses of spotted salamanders, which you see here uh, in a site. And, uh, and that's used to extrapolate this population size estimate. Next, please. I'll show you one quick illustration of how significant this can be. Here is a pretty little vernal pool of excellent quality on top of a low ridge in uh, southern Bath County, so the lower portion of the Calpasture River Valley. And this has uh, five obligate species, spotted, marbled, Jefferson salamanders, wood frogs, and the spring fairy shrimp. Nice quality pond. Next slide. Here is what I was particularly interested in. This is a large raft or aggregation of wood frog egg masses. Each mass represents one female or mama wood frog. Now, if you can get there quickly after the females have deposited their eggs and before the water causes them to swell and fuse together. And you can count every individual egg mass. It's a little tedious. Then you can extrapolate relative population size. Now, this was nearly 200 egg masses, and that accounts for on the order of 1,000 breeding wood frogs in the surrounding woods that came to this one vernal pool. And what you realize is this wetland supports a living community in the surrounding forest that puts mucho biomass into that system. These animals, whether as adults being eaten by a snake or a hawk, or the eggs or tadpoles being eaten in the pool by aquatic or semi-aquatic animals, they are putting a tremendous amount of food base into that system. And that is very critical to the flow of energy through that system. So I do not lose any sleep at night with the understanding that my favorite group of animals has, as perhaps their most important ecological function, feeding the rest of the world. <laughs> that is what they do. Next slide, please. Now, finally, and I'm just, I am done here. I, I apologize for our, our challenges. I trust this has come through. Uh, I'm wrapping up now so I can take some questions. But it is, of course, important that I mention climate change concerns are really at the center of our studies and our efforts now. The fact that these are seasonal wetlands driven by annual precipitation in their hydrology uh, and, and the ways that that is changing now creates an uncertain future for these habitats. You can check out this BBC article linked here. Next, please. Final thought, here's an illustration. This is one of those pools I inventory for the forest, uh, on the National Forest in Bath County. You'll note at the top, this image, that's the spring. And that's how that pool should look at full pond in spring. This is why we call them spring pools or vernal pools. They are full and teeming with life. Look at the bottom images. Here's what's happening. On the left, that's the same site dry when it should be wet, full of water. Bottom right image, there's the same site when it should be dry and is full of water. I've been seeing this flip-flop in hydrological dynamics in these systems for some years now. And that is what creates 
uh, the, the biggest concern for us because the hydro period or length of time that the pool holds water has everything to do with the biological dynamics and the biological phenomena uh, like uh, the reproduction of these, these keystone species, uh, frogs and salamanders in the forest. So that's a, that's a big unknown. It is pretty disturbing. What do I do to deal with that stress? Next slide, please. I hope there's some chuckles. I keep my head in the I keep my head in the wetlands. I I stick to my chore of studying these places and monitoring these places. I find my happy place in in these wetlands. So uh, I I trust this has given you an overview. Go to the, the go to the last slide, Matt. Um, this is a good time. There is a renewed fascination and interest in these habitats. I want to encourage you to download my friend Stephen's ebook uh, that is that is brand new, hot off the press. It is photography of vernal pool denizens is fantastic. His work was featured this summer in the Nature Conservancy magazine. So do check some of this out. It's very inspiring. And that, of course, is what Stephen does. He uses his photography to, uh, to inspire conservation of vernal pools. Final slide, questions, please. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we do have time for, for one question. We uh, want to try and get back on track here. Uh, Liz? Great. Um, what, if any, special measures are afforded to vernal pools by state and federal agencies outside of the usual wetland protective measures? Gotcha. Legal protection, that's always the big question. In Virginia, we are behind the curve of places like New England and California that have specific state uh, or, or even uh, local level legislative protection for vernal pools specifically. We do not have specific vernal pool protection laws or laws specifically to protect isolated wetlands. There's been one attempt, but it didn't make it in Virginia. However, however, the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality has jurisdiction over these wetlands in the state of Virginia, uh, in the state of Virginia, even though these wetlands are, are isolated, non-navigable, and do not presently fall under U.S. Army Corps or 401, uh, protection, the, the state does regulate them. No one under any circumstances, regardless of ownership, can alter any isolated wetland without the express permission through a permit process uh, by the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. That's the, the legal protection we have, but it is really incumbent upon us, the citizenry, to be the eyes and ears for this agency and to report because these are such small scenarios. So to be honest with you, grassroots, uh, progressive, um, proactive grassroots education about them is, is probably the most important function right now. Great. Great, Mike. Thank you. Well, appreciate you uh, taking time and uh, being adaptable uh, as a uh, many of those uh, organisms that you talk about uh, have to be nowadays uh, to uh, My talk pleasure. this afternoon. My um, pleasure, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to uh, take a short 10 minute break. We will reconvene at uh, 2.35 uh, to wrap up our last two speakers. Okay, I uh, hope everyone is back from break. Uh, we're going to get ready and get started. Um, I think we've had a great conference so far. Uh, we've heard from six outstanding speakers and we have two more left. Um, our next speaker today is Liz Chidoba. Uh, Liz is the Water Quality Monitoring Initiative Director for the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. She graduated from the University of North Carolina, North Carolina Wilmington with an MS in Marine Science and from the Vermont Law School with a Master's of Environmental Law and Policy. Uh, for a short time, she was to my great fortune and probably her a uh, great misfortune, uh, a summer intern for me while I was working at DEQ. Uh, Liz manages the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative, an initiative to integrate community science data 
in the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership. She also manages other water quality monitoring projects. Thank you, Liz, for telling us about the, or uh, thank you for coming on to talk about the CMC program. Thanks, James, and it was a pleasure working with you at DEQ. Um, it wasn't. <laughs> so thanks for having me on today, and thanks everyone for sticking through and joining us for this last session of the day today. So I'm going to be talking about a really cool project that we were able to do within the CMC or the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative um, and ways that we've been able to really use the data collected through this network of community-based volunteer monitoring programs in ways that we didn't really expect. Um, so next slide. So just to give a little bit of background, I assume most people have heard of us by now, but in case you haven't, um, the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative, or CMC as we call it, was started in 2015 through a cooperative agreement between the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and the Chesapeake Bay Program. And we have four partner organizations, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, the Isaac Walton League of America, the Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring, and the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And those four partner organizations act as the service providers, working with all of the individual monitoring groups um, throughout the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed. So we each work in different jurisdictions, and we work with um, chemical monitoring groups and benthic macroinvertebrate monitoring groups as well. And the goal is to bring together all of these very diverse volunteer-based water quality monitoring programs into one centralized database using similar methods so that it can be used by the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership and by the state agencies. Next slide, please. So again, the goal of this is to bring together all of this data so that it can be used by the Bay Program. And the reason that this came to be is because you can see in this map, the volunteer and community-based monitoring programs are in the light green and dark black sites. And the Chesapeake Bay Program monitoring sites are in that kind of blue color. And those focus mostly on the bay itself and the major tributaries, whereas the volunteer collected data focuses on the headwaters and some smaller tributaries. So combining these two data sets can really give us a bigger picture and a better picture of the health of the Chesapeake Bay watershed as a whole. Next slide, please. So in order to classify data um, and to make data collected in Pennsylvania equivalent um, and standardized with, with data collected in Virginia, we created a tiered framework system that consists of three tiers. The bottom tier is tier one, which is used for educational purposes and kind of those ecosystem health screenings. As you go up the pyramid, you get increased QA standards, increased time, rigor, and expense. So tier two gets into report cards um, and targeting of management actions. Those typically are taken with calibrated equipment, um, again, getting into that time and QA standards. And then our tier three data is actually audited by the Bay Program and equivalent, considered equivalent to the state and federal agency collected data. So it can actually be used in regulatory water quality assessments. And for the first time this year, the Bay Program is running their 2018 to 2020 assessment um, right now, and they are using volunteer collected data from the CMC um, in that assessment this year, which is really exciting. Um, and currently our tier three program is only in tidal areas because that is what is used in the assessment. Next slide, please. And then all of this kind of comes together with the Chesapeake Data Explorer, which is our crown jewel of the CMC and what houses all of the amazing data that's collected through all of these volunteer-based programs. We have 
over 450, or no, not over, almost 450,000 data points um, covering 2,500 stations. We have data from all seven Bay jurisdictions, and we have about 116 participating organizations that are uploading data. Um, and the website is listed here, and I can throw that in the chat box as well after this presentation. And so this really, the Data Explorer is really um, the place where we can now utilize this data in a broader context. You can go, you can visualize the data on the home screen as seen here on this picture. You can query and download any of the data in the system as well. And so now that we're able to kind of see this all together and use this all together, next slide, Matt. We were able to actually, we were presented with a really cool opportunity back in 2020 where we actually hosted a hackathon. So we partnered with Booz Allen Hamilton and a special thanks to their women in data science team and their 501 office green team. Um, and we partnered with them to host a virtual hackathon called Hack the Bay in order to take all of this community collected data, put it together with Bay program collected data, and really start to see how that changed the landscape of the Chesapeake Bay and our understanding of the Chesapeake Bay and the watershed. So we originally intended this event to be an in-person event on Earth Day 2020, um, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, but we all know that COVID did not make that feasible. So we switched it to a virtual event. And this is the first time that Booz Allen Hamilton had held a virtual hackathon. So it was all a very new experience for all of us. Um, and we held that on October, August 3rd through September 20th of 2020. Next slide, please. So again, the goal of this was really to crowdsource solutions and challenges um, faced by the CMC and explore innovative ways that we can look at this data as a whole, together as a unit across the Bay watershed and foster those collaborative environments for addressing these really complex solutions. Next slide, please. So the hackathon consisted of four different challenge tracks. Um, the first challenge focused on developing a restoration case study. So this was really looking at data over time and comparing that to some type of land use change or policy to see if we could really start to parse out any water quality um, indicators that would uh, reflect those policy changes. The second challenge was identifying data gaps. So this is really aimed at doing a second look at the prioritization report that the CMC did in 2016 when we got started and continuing to assess where we still have spatial and temporal and parameter-based um, data gaps. The third challenge was modeling water pollution. Um, and this was a, this branched off of another hackathon that Booz Allen actually participated in where they were modeling total nitrogen loads throughout the Bay watershed. And then challenge four was designing a water quality report card. So this was trying to get at the social benefit aspect of the data collecting and how we can really better engage the public in broadcasting the data and making it relevant to their needs. I will say that was the most broad topic of all four of them. And we actually did not get any completed projects um, from that challenge, which we kind of assumed going into it, but we did get some really creative, partially scoped solutions for that challenge. Um, so overall, we received 20 projects total um, that included the 10 complete projects and then the 10 creative partially scoped solutions. Next slide. So I'm just going to go through a few of the submissions that we got and kind of what it means to us and 
what we're kind of doing from here um, with this, with these submissions. So one really um, exciting submission was this project on the South River in Virginia. So this is in Southwest Virginia on Canada Run in the South River. And this group focused on temperature, pH, and conductivity over a three-year period. Um, and they broke it down by seasons and kind of tracked those changes over time for those three parameters. Um, and what's really of interest here is that they also did some digging in the policy and found that this watershed in particular was um, one of the highest priority watersheds in the George Washington National Forest and region. And um, that the data that they analyzed showed that over this period of five years, they analyzed a period of five years, not three years, my apologies. Um, they did see significant improvements in the conductivity and pH scores, um, and also a slight decrease in the water temperature, which is also a good thing that we're looking for in these headwater streams, because it was on an increased uh, temperature trend and then started to de decrease. So, you know, the data in and of itself is kind of leaning towards there might be some link to policy. Obviously, we need to do a deeper dive into, you know, the other nuances that could go into this, but it's a good kind of first step that this data might actually be able to show, might be nuanced enough to show us some, um, some trends based on policy decisions. Next slide, please. So one of our other um, submissions that we got, which is also a really cool and innovative idea, is just to look at temperature trends over time, which may not seem super innovative, but when you think about it, you know, temperature is one of the most robustly monitored parameters across the watershed, but we haven't really looked at it as a whole across the watershed. So it was really cool. Um, this was just one girl who was working on this um, project and it was super impressive what she was able to come up with over a few weeks time in order to look at these temperature trends across different seasons and across the Bay watershed as a whole. Um, so this is again a more exploratory approach to data analysis at this scale. Um, and so something that no one has really done to this point with this type of data set and combined with the Bay program data. Um, so this definitely opened up a lot more questions and um, also pointed out some additional gaps that we should maybe try to fill um, with some temperature data in order to get a more robust data set. And I'll talk about how we're expanding on this project in a little bit. Next slide. So one of the modeling projects that we got submission for, um, again, built off of a model created for a different hackathon by the Booz Allen team, modeling total nitrogen through the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And I am not even going to pretend like I know anything about modeling because I do not. So I will, again, put the link in the chat box to the YouTube videos that beautifully explain what this model means. Um, but really the highlight here is that, you know, this, this team worked on a model for six weeks um, with a data set that they were not familiar with and really came up with some similar ideas and um, outcomes that we know from the models that we've been working on since the 80s and 90s that are very complicated models and take in a lot of information. So what we really took away from this type of challenge was that, you know, maybe we need to look at, you know, the new code and the new approaches and just different ways of thinking about modeling um, that might help us kind of, again, assess these different nutrients pathways throughout the watershed. Next slide. All right, so overall, we were super excited about the participation um, and the amazing project that we received. We were again blown away that in six weeks, people could come up with, you know, full blown watershed scale models of um, 
you know, these nutrients in the bay. We engaged over 400 people from all over the world. So regardless of the actual projects that we received, you know, we just engaged a brand new audience that we had never engaged with before and now knows a little bit more about the Chesapeake Bay watershed and some of the issues that are being faced here. Um, and we started to gain insights about how this data can be used. Again, it opened up a lot more questions and we have a lot of lessons learned um, from this project and moving forward, you know, one of the things that we really need to do is refine those questions. So again, since we hadn't done anything like this before, we kind of threw out these big lofty, I don't know, look at the data, see what you see. Um, and now that we kind of have some of these projects and have these really creative folks who were, um, who put these projects together, you know, we have different paths that we can go down now and ask more specific questions, get some more refined data sets, even start thinking about additional data sets that we can add to the data explorer to kind of fill in some of these gaps. Um, I will say there was a, there was a challenge working virtually that I think um, it was really nice that folks had a lot more time. So I think we got some projects submitted that were a lot further along than what we would have gotten in a one day um, like blitz hackathon. But there are some challenges when you're going in between, um, you know, us as the data collectors and the data scientists. Um, and I think some folks were getting caught up along the way that we could have very easily if we were in person could have gotten over some of those hurdles and gotten a little bit farther down the line. Um, but overall, it was a great project and we were really excited to um, find out all of these really cool solutions that people came up with. Um, and then next slide. And then lastly, just to touch on the continued work that we are doing with these data sets. So, um, and has been as with UMSIs, and she has been continuing to work with the temperature data and kind of refining, looking at these trends over time with the data sets that we have available. So we started refining this, um, thinking about temperature, water temperature data across the watershed as a whole. Um, and we started brainstorming some ways that this could be helpful. And so we were looking at temperature trends over time. We ended up breaking this into the upper watershed region um, in Pennsylvania and New York, um, which is the left-hand box at the top left-hand corner, and then the lower watershed, which is the bottom, uh, or which is the right-hand picture up at the top there. Um, and, you know, we were able to start seeing kind of some seasonal trends and some trends over time with the water temperature data. Um, and this has really come up uh, showing us that we really do need to start getting our historic data back in the system. Um, Pennsylvania and New York has been pushing historic data. So they have some data sets in there in the system in the data explorer that are 20 years old, whereas down in the lower watershed, um, I haven't been quite as has on top of it getting our historic data in there. So our data sets don't go back as far. Um, so I think that's one thing that we're going to start working on in order to Kind of push this work forward. Um, and then I also really just want to point out uh, this amazing work that we started working on with Wesley Irwin, who is a high school student in Maryland. Um, and he is working in Minecraft, looking at ways that we can visualize water quality data within a water column. So this picture kind of represents what it would look like if you dove down into a waterway um, and kind of visualize a depth profile sample of dissolved oxygen. Um, and so he, you know, he just kind of did this as a summer project. Um, and so we're thinking about doing another hackathon in that sort of a Minecraft space to think of different ways that we can visualize data and also, again, connect to different audiences. So we're really thinking that this might be a good way that we could connect to school age kids and really give them some tangible things that they can see about the data and then also ways that they can actually pull some real data out of these um, visualizations and play with it on their own. 
as well. So next slide. That is all I have for today. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Liz. Uh, I can tell you, coming from a uh, DEQ, we dealt with a lot of data and uh, kind of wishing we did a hackathon ourselves. <laughs> Um, we do have some questions. And in fact, uh, on that vein, um, got a question here of uh, how do you engage uh, Hack the Bay participants? And how did you share any of these results with the groups that collected the data? Um, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, so we, Booz Allen and Hamilton did most of our Hack the Bay uh, engagement with participants. We went to a lot of universities, we went to a lot of their networks um, that they, to pull data scientists mostly, because um, that is not who is within the CMC network for the most part. So Booz Allen Hamilton did most of the outreach for the actual hackathon participants. Um, we do have, we shared, I mean, we told all of our CMC network throughout the entire experience that it was happening. All of the presentations um, that we did were hosted openly that folks could still come and hear, you know, what was going on. And then we did broadcast the results to our network after, after the event and they're hosted on the CMC website. So you can still go to the CMC website and I'll throw the link in the chat box. Um, but you can see all of the YouTube videos that all of the uh, participants put together. Um, that, and there's GitHub for each of the projects too. So if you're interested in kind of seeing what they did, uh, again, not my realm, I don't understand any of that coding, but if you're interested in picking up any of it, feel free to visit those GitHubs and check it out. <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, uh, some people in chat here are kind of geeking out about the uh, Minecraft visualization. Uh, they were kind of wondering if there was a, uh, uh, plans for using these visualizations for educational purposes or for monitoring? Yes. So this is like a brand new thing. I mean, we just started working on this a few weeks ago when Wes came to us and was like, hey, is this even like a thing that would be helpful? And we all were like, um, yes. <laughs> so we're all geeking out on it too and still trying to figure out what it'll look like. But um, some of the things that we've thrown around are trying to create um, educational videos. So having, you know, a, a, a well-known education center um, on the Chesapeake Bay kind of recreated in Minecraft. And you can, again, my understanding is very limited, but you can create flights that kind of go through Minecraft and video. So you could see what we're kind of envisioning is maybe creating a video where you'd fly out to this education center, kind of dive down in the water, see these visualizations of the data, and then also be able to actually like retrieve data. So it would kind of mimic taking a classroom out into the field and collecting the data without actually having to take a whole classroom out to a waterway. Um, and then we could have some Excel files with those data points, um, you know, embedded in the video or available for the teachers afterwards that the kids could then take and play with on their own. Um, so that's kind of our first thought. Um, and again, we're kind of, I think our next step is to do kind of a mini hackathon, just kind of um, exploring the different visualization options within Minecraft um, to see you know, what the options are available. But I think that there's a lot of potential here. So if anybody's interested in kind of helping with this aspect of it, feel free to reach out to me. <laughs> Great, I did have one final question here. Um, have you considered adapting the Chesapeake Bay program Bay Trends modeling package to the citizen monitoring data like you have on the CMC? And is there any availability of uh, using uh, or being able to share this data, I guess, as a uh, R statistical uh, or to be put, be available so it can be um, analyzed through programs like R, uh, like statistical modeling, <laughs> statistical analysis. I'm not exactly sure how to answer that um, because I am not a modeling person. 
Um, I will say we are continually working with the Bay program to integrate this data into the modeling, but I am not exactly sure how any of that actually feasibly happens or what it would take to change any part of that process to incorporate the CMC data into that modeling effort. So I can definitely look into it at the Bay program level and see and, you know, follow up with that question. Great, Liz. Well, thank you for your time and for uh, sharing this this great uh, growth of the CMC process. Uh, it's been amazing seeing how it has grown over the past uh, years and continues to grow. Um, for our last speaker uh, for today um, is uh, Dr. Uh, Diana Henry. Uh, Dr. Henry will tell us about a, a fun and educational activity to teach youth about water quality. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Henry. Uh, she retired in 2013 from the College of William & Mary, where she served as an administrative and instructional, instructional faculty member. She has been a new, um, uh, has begun a new life as a master naturalist and has trained as a master gardener and a tree steward. Uh, I can tell from personal experience from working with her uh, during my time at DEQ, she is very passionate about clean water. <laughs> Dr. Henry has been uh, leading a dozen water quality uh, testers for the uh, Peninsula chapter of the Virginia Master Naturalist Program. She currently serves as the outreach chair and is the past president of the chapter. Uh, she is also an obedient and loving servant of a white lab uh, Labrador and two cats. Welcome, Dr. Henry. Well, thank James, thank you so much for that introduction. And I do not know why my video is not showing up because my little camera light is on. So, uh, we can see you. Oh, can you? Oh, great. Um, I want to thank, I want again, I want to thank you for the introduction and I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of this event. Um, it's really been a delight to hear everybody talking about education outreach and how important it is to get our message out to adults, citizens, uh, high schoolers, uh, you know, this, this, this new one that Liz has just pr proposed is just unbelievable. Um, but I'm a grassroots person. I believe in starting it, starting it young. And this activity is based on elementary school children. Yes, elementary school children, because all elementary school children have either parents or teachers hanging right next to them. Uh, so it's an activity that allows, the, allows everyone to learn something because it's amazing how many parents have no idea what a watershed is. Um, like James said, we have 21 sites here uh, in the, on the peninsula. We are surrounded by the James, the York, and the Hampton Roads. Uh, we've been doing it for seven years. It seems like forever. Um, so we've been doing a lot of citizen science, but the activity I'm going to show you, it's on a video. Uh, we do it at local uh, schools at third and fourth grades. Takes about 20, 25 minutes. Um, and I also do it at after school programs for disadvantaged youths. We also take it on the road to do um, fest uh, festivals. So at our, and anytime there's a, a plant sale or a festival, we take out our little handy dandy little, uh, handy dandy little, uh, outreach and start educating people about the importance of water. So I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to let people view the uh, video I put. If this is an interactive, this is where everybody gets involved. And so I had to put it on a video because there's no way a PowerPoint would ever give this any kind of justice. So Matt, take it away. Hi, I'm Diana Henry. I am the Education Outreach Chair and past president of the Peninsula Master Naturalists. We are located in Hampton, Newport News, York County, and Pocosin. My passion is water quality and teaching 
at children, water quality education activities, and safety. We had been doing educational activities with the local elementary schools, mostly third and fourth grades. We also have participated in outdoor children's festivals. The kids love this activity, and where you have kids, you have parents or teachers always listening. You don't need much, a map of your waterway, some cheap toys, paper cups, and marbles. Being on the peninsula, the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries are important. Our map is of the Chesapeake Bay and its watershed, but you can do the same activities for your local watershed. There are four goals to this fun. Learning the names of the four major rivers in Virginia, which is part of the fourth grade SOL. Learning the diversity of animals in the watershed, biology and science. Correctly locating your location on the map, geography. And lastly, the effects of upstream pollution and tides on the Bay Ecology. This is the map of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which was created by one of our artistic members. The first activity that we do with the kids is for them to correctly place our homemade sailboats on the correct rivers. These sailboats have the names of the four rivers. The teacher chooses a student or a team of students to place the boat on the correct river. This is a great way of reinforcing the names of the rivers that they should know for the fourth grade SOL. Please remember your jacket. Potomac, Rappahannock, York, and James. The second part of this activity is a ring toss. The, the children stand here and toss the rings onto their favorite sailboat. It's not as easy as it looks. The second fun activity is Beanie Babies. There are a variety of animals here, some land animals, some water animals, some fresh water, and some salt water. The idea is to give one to each child and have them place it where they think it lives. Here's an example of animals being placed on the, on the Chesapeake Bay watershed map. Some are placed correctly, some are not. The idea is to be able to talk to the students about what animals live where and why the water is important. All our animals need access to clean water. Some animals live close to the water, like the otter, some live in the water, some on the outside, but they all need clean water. One of the keystone animals for the Chesapeake Bay is the oyster. It helps clean the nutrients and pollution out of the bay, and why there is a big effort to help restore the oyster in the Chesapeake Bay. Make sure you count your beanies before and after you place them because they do walk away. The third activity requires either marbles, bells, or some sort of token that you give to each child and adult. The idea is for them to place on the map where they think they live. It's amazing how many children do not know where they are on the Chesapeake Bay. Once each child has placed their marble or token on the map, talk about where they think they live and then told, show them that we actually live right about here. And it's important to know where you live on the Chesapeake Bay. For the fourth activity, we're going to remove the boats to make it easier to understand the flow of the rivers and the tides in the Chesapeake Bay. For this fourth activity, you can use an item like paper or paper cups. What we're going to demonstrate is how pollution from upstream flows downstream to the Chesapeake Bay. Have the children take your paper cup, crush them, throw them on the land. At this point, we're going to pretend we're the Piedmont Mountains. And where does the pollution all go? 
it goes to the bay. So it's important what happens upstream because it goes downstream. Another portion about ecology is not only that pollution flows downstream with the rivers, but due to the tides, the pollution goes back upstream. When there's high tide, the pollution goes back upriver. So it's important not only to have clean water at the top, but also to make sure you have clean water at the downstream at the Chesapeake Bay. Okay. The Chesapeake Bay watershed encompasses six states besides Virginia, West Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and New York. What happens on any of these rivers and the Susquehanna in Pennsylvania all flows down to the Chesapeake Bay. I hope you've enjoyed this educational outreach activity and I hope you can adapt it to your own waterways. All right, I am, um, I, okay, uh, that's my, my little spiel. It's a really quick activity and the kids love playing ring toss. The kids literally, and parents literally have no idea where they live on the Chesapeake Bay, which is really kind of frightening. Um, but it's a good way to get them started to thinking about the importance of keeping your water clean. Um, as I said, we do 20, we um, monitor 21 sites. We also do water cleanups. And it's amazing how many bottles of plastic water bottles we will pull out three or four times a year. So um, at this point, this is a really short presentation. Uh, if you have any questions uh, or anything, please let me know. I know that is a fantastic uh, education exercise. Uh, don't think I've ever come across one that is as effective and covers so many different things in one activity. It's, it's truly outstanding. Thank you. Um, Liz, uh, do we have any questions? Yes, we have a few so far. Um, do you have any idea of how many students you have reached with this program? Probably four or 500. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, um, at the schools, the schools are usually, the classes are usually 30 a piece and I will do um, two classes a day after school programs. Um, I'll do like a week long and I will do different portions. Uh, when I bring it to festivals, three or 400 kids and parents are all tossing rings. Yeah, this seems like a much more mobile activity than the Enviroscape that you can take to festivals. <laughs> Ours is, paint, ours is painted on canvas, so I can literally roll it up, put the Beanie Babies in, and it's done. Yeah, that's great. Um, are there any concepts that you seem, uh, when you teach this, that students really seem to struggle with more than others? Or are there any concepts that they really seem to get um, after this activity that really hits home for them? The, big, the biggest thing is uh, the idea of a watershed. That word means nothing. Um, a lot of people say, I don't care about the water because I don't live on the water. Understanding the concept of watershed, and that's why that last activity is so important, is w trash just flows downhill. Um, and they get that idea. On top, of, on top of this activity, I also do some warm well warm water safety uh, activities and cold water safety activities i'm into i'm into kids and activities and safety um they're all so appreciative of the the knowledge and um many are, are shocked that the, you know the parents and children parents and teachers are shocked that kids have no idea where they live on the bay
Great. That is, Thank uh, you. Again, just fantastic. Um, I might have to uh, steal your idea for my swan water district. <laughs> Please do. I encourage people to make their own little map. Um, again, it's the SOLs. It was needing to know. They they need to know. Please remember your jacket, the Potomac, Rappahannock, uh, and York and James. So um, it's it it reinforces what the teachers need to teach them. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. If you have any questions, uh, you can probably find me somewhere on the Peninsula Master Naturalist website. All right. Thank you. But I do want to express our appreciation for all the speakers today. Uh, we do appreciate your time or their time and the information that they provided. Um, I know I've personally learned a great deal uh, from today's talks, and I'm sure everyone here uh, has as well. I wanted to also thank all the uh, everyone for uh, joining us today and uh, the interest in Virginia Water Resources by participating in today's conference. Thank you also for all of our partners who made this event possible, our speakers. In Rico County, the Alliance Chesapeake Bay, the Virginia Water Resources Research Center at Virginia Tech, the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality with funding from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the Virginia Lakes and Watersheds Association, the Lake Anna Civic, uh, Lake Anna Civic League, and members of the Water Monitoring Council Steering Committee who assisted with planning and implementing this event. It does take a lot of work to put on such an event, especially in these current times. Uh, a webinar is uh, probably almost as much work as, as uh, working in person. Um, and we do appreciate all the generosity uh, that people have provided to make this event possible. As a reminder, the Virginia Water Monitoring Council promotes information sharing along, um, among its membership and encourages collaborations among water monitoring programs in Virginia. A few final facts about the Virginia Water Monitoring Council. We uh, have been in existence for 22 years. Uh, we have more than 700 members. Anyone with an interest in water monitoring can join the Virginia Water Monitoring Council. Uh, membership is free. Members do receive weekly sets of announcements about water-related events job op opportunities, and publications on regional and statewide interest. If you're not already a member of the Virginia Water Monitoring Council, please consider joining us. Send your contact information to vwmc at vt.edu. You can learn more about the Virginia Water Monitoring Council from our website. The address of our website is www.virginia, spelled out V-I-R-G-I-N-I-A, WMC.org. To wrap up the 2021 Virginia Water Monitoring Council Conference, I have a few reminders. After the conference, you, uh, we will send an email message with a link to the recorded presentations and an attendance certificate. We also ask, uh, we'll also include a link to a post-conference survey. Please complete the survey as it will be helpful for us to plan our 2022 conference. This concludes the 2021 Virginia Water Monitoring Council Conference. We thank you all for attending, and we hope to see you in person next year. Thank you.